Baseball isn't just numbers, numbers, numbers. This game is not being played on computers. You don't do that with a bunch of statistical gimmicks. You don't put a team together with a computer. Pure. We're talking weighted runs created plus. Expected Woba. His sweet spot rate. Defensive runs above average. Average exit velocity. Barrel rate. XFIP. BABIP. S-I-E-R-A. We are Above Replacement Radio. And welcome to Above Replacement Radio. We're talking baseball. Kind of whenever I'm your host, Chris Gianta, over there. On the other side of the screen is Daniel Curran. How you doing, Daniel? Chris, I'm doing very well today. We are continuing our uh, Hall of Fame bubble cases today. We are continuing our positional top tens heading into 2024. Uh, we got starting pitcher and right field today, and then we got Jimmy Rollins on the Hall of Fame ballot. Yeah, very, very exciting stuff. Um, happy to be doing this on a weekly basis, at least, you know, with the Hall of Fame, we have we have three of them. And then with the positional breakdowns, we have 10 of them over a five week span. Um, so, yeah, good, good to good to get into this and uh, continue this from last week. But first, we have a little bit of news to get into. There were there were a few signings, nothing, nothing that was blowing the radar up, but some some guys that are going to improve some contending teams uh, nonetheless. But. First, we can start out with, I guess, uh, Teoscar Hernandez, which happened um, a little bit ago, not not uh, far after um, we stopped recording uh, last week. But Teoscar Hernandez signs a one-year, $23.5 million deal with the Los Angeles Dodgers. Um, what did you think about this move? I mean, I think the most interesting thing about it was that was the contract details. One year, $23.5 million. Uh, for Teoscar Hernandez, he's a guy that like there was a lot of reporting about him getting a multi-year deal. Some teams willing to go to like a fourth, fifth year uh, on a contract for Teoscar Hernandez, and it kind of seems like he's betting on himself here, uh, putting himself on a team that is you know immediately championship contending, uh, putting himself in an environment where he'll probably has a he probably has a better chance of succeeding more than he does in Seattle. Uh, you know, I'll get more into those numbers later, but um. You know, I mean, it really feels like he's he's betting on himself here. Right. Yeah, it, it definitely seems so, which is interesting. Usually you see that out of a free agent that's maybe going into his age 28 or 29 season. Uh, Teoscar Hernandez is going into his age 31 season. So the odds of him, you know, he's he's probably not going to get himself a five year deal after this year. But um, I, I I imagine he's trying to get something better than what he would have gotten. Maybe a maybe something for like 20 million a year um yeah on a three to four year you know level uh you know with a uh, lengthwise um and i think what you what you're prefacing is also some stuff that i had some notes on is yeah like home road splits that's that exactly was, what i was gonna pull up that was that's pretty absurd like you know uh an 830 ops on the road as opposed to a 643 ops uh at home which you know the t-mobile park had the lowest offensive park factor according to Statcast uh last year so it makes a good bit of sense that he had a lot more success on the road um what did you think about just you know that those home road splits yeah i mean it feels like uh teoscar hernandez just wasn't you know kind of built for team mobile park yeah i mean the it's it is a pitcher friendly ballpark it kind of always has been um especially for uh, against right-handed hitters um and yeah, I mean, we've seen, you know, Teoscar and Hernandez, I think, kind of generally just had an offensive down year compared to a lot of the years that he had in Toronto. Um, you know, only a, only a 106 OPS plus last year. And in the three prior years from 2020 through 2022, uh, he was about in like the 130 range uh, pretty consistently. In fact, his, yeah, it was exactly 133. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a 30 point drop just about in OPS plus from year to year. And, um, you know, I mean, his strikeout rate did balloon up to 31.1%, but it also was pretty high before then. Uh, his walk rate went down to 5.6%, but it was also pretty low before then. So his strikeout to walk rate rates didn't get better, but they weren't necessarily great to begin with. Um, so, you know, I think playing in T-Mobile Park did hurt him quite a bit. Um, and I'm sure, you know, Dodgers Stadium is going to be a little bit of a better fit for him. Yeah, for sure. You know, 396 to... 396 to center it's it's kind of I it's probably like kind of neutral in terms of the 
um, pitcher hitter balance uh, park factor was. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I think. But I, I would imagine that, it's closer to it's closer to the uh, the Rogers Center than it is the T-Mobile Park. Yes, yes, I would agree with that. Um, yeah, like uh, I it, it's it's definitely it that's definitely eye opening into why he may have taken the one year deal because he believes and maybe his agency believes that he can do far better, you know, in just a different environment, uh, which makes a lot of sense. I mean, he was much better as a Toronto Blue Jay, um, at least offensively. And uh, also, I think, um, you know, with the with the Dodgers getting him, I don't like the team, you could argue is already sort of complete, but it it sort of completes the team and complements their outfield. They just have so many options right now um, in the outfield. Like they could still make bets and out. They could still have bets in the outfield. Sometimes I, I know he's going to be primary second base, but he could still go to the outfield. Sometimes they have Outman out there. Now Teoscar Hernandez, uh, Jason Hayward, Chris Taylor, Manuel Margot. So, and they're not going to have, they don't have to have Hernandez in there like every single day. And I think part of what's attractive about Hernandez is, is is his ability to hit lefties uh since 2021 he has a 628 slugging against lefties and out of 194 hitters with 300 plus plate appearances against lefties since 2021 he has the highest slugging against them so those splits are really favorable and considering maybe he'll get just a higher percentage of um plate appearances against lefties uh it, it might just put him in an even better position there yeah, uh, Teoscar Hernandez has had an exit velocity of at least 91 miles per hour in every single season since 2018. Um, he also lifts the ball pretty consistently. His his launch angle has always been uh, double digits. His highest ground ball rate uh, in his, since 2018 has been uh, 44.4%, and his uh, lowest fly ball rate has been 25.6%. And I feel like the Dodgers can skew those numbers even better in his favor. Uh, the uh, the big interesting thing is that he's one of the few hitters that actually sees more uh, sliders than four seam fastballs, and there's good reason for it. He has a 38 percent. He had a 38.4 percent whiff rate on sliders last year. That's probably another part of the reason why he had such a down year last year is that AL West pitchers kind of had him figured out more than AL East pitchers did, uh, because they just fed him a very healthy dose of sliders, and he never really adjusted to them because he hit 215 with a 231 expected batting average against them last year. He slugged 323 with a 402 expected slug, which is better, but still not fantastic. And he hits four seam fastballs extremely well. He actually hits sinkers pretty well, change ups very well, actually. But uh breaking balls he just had a lot of trouble with and pitchers uh pounded him with breaking balls the entire season. And they really started doing that last year. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I imagine that that's part of what led to um, you know, the slight offensive downturn that he had um also Teoscar Hernandez was like very very streaky last year had a couple months where I think one of his one one of the months he had was a he had a 949 OPS one he had like an 1100 OPS but he had like three where he was like at a sub 700 OPS so you know he was very up and down last year um wondering if the Dodgers are gonna create a little bit more consistency but um, what do you think about what his impact might be on, you know, in Los Angeles? Yeah, I mean, he's going to be, you know, he's going to be kind of in, weirdly in the same role that he's been in his entire career. It feels like every team that he's been on, he's been a part of a very strong offense with a lot of versatile hitters, right? In Toronto, he was there with Vlad Jr. He was there with Bo Bichette. Uh, he was there, was there with George Springer. I, uh, you know, in Seattle, he came over with Julio, Rod you know, he came over in a lineup with Julio Rodriguez, with Cal Raleigh, with Ty France, guys that they expected. J.P. Crawford had a breakout year. Um, and, you know, now he's going to the Dodgers, right? They have a ton of star power in that lineup. He's like, at best, maybe the like fourth or fifth best hitter in that lineup uh, on a good day. So, you know, they I don't think they need too much out of him. They can't even platoon him if they really want to, although 23 mil is probably quite a lot for a platoon. Uh, bat, but he hits lefties extremely well. Um, I think the Dodgers can kind of fix this guy up quite a bit. Right, right, and he, yeah, that that's part of the point I was getting at with his lefty numbers is like, obviously they're not gonna have him go only against lefties, but I'm sure yeah. he's gonna have some. He might be hitting fourth, yeah. Some days where also he might 
be sitting against righties and maybe he's not going to play like 150 games this year. Maybe it's more going to going to be more like 130 if he stays healthy all the way, just because yeah. of how many options the Dodgers have, you know, especially if they got, you know, there's a right hander on the mound. You have like Hayward and Outman um, in the outfield already. So like might as well give Hernandez a rest day because, you know, obviously he might, he's not as effective against right-handed, uh, right-handed pitching, but um but yeah, it should be interesting. It seems like one of those Dodgers deals where it goes quiet in the off season, but you know, just could could be like a game changer. Um, yeah, yeah, on April fifteenth, on April fifteenth, we're gonna get the was Teoscar Hernandez the best Dodgers off season acquisition actually? Yeah, <laughs> into the debates. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, we will definitely have those. Um, yeah, anything more on uh on the signing? Yeah, I mean, I like it for the Dodgers. I like it for Teoscar Hernandez. You know, I think he needs a different environment um, to really set himself up for a good uh, second free agency. And, uh, I mean, he's going to go for a championship while he's at it. So good for him. Yeah, good for him. Good for him. Getting $23 million to be, you know, on the obvious World Series favorites. Um, so another deal uh, that went down. Uh, significant there were a couple deals significant to the pitcher market um i would argue more notably the shota imanaga signing um you know a guy coming over from japan he's heading into his age 30 season i believe or 31 season Mm -hmm. um and uh you know obviously not the profile that yamamoto had and it it speaks with uh the deal that he got, I think it's two years, $30 million or something like that, which is much less than the market. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I think it has some weird details, but nonetheless, it's much less than the market predicted. I think MLB trade rumors had him going for like five years, 85 million, but um, you know, the market, I guess was hesitating on him a little bit, but he goes to the Cubs. Um, What did you think about this move? So I believe John Heyman actually reported that there was a team willing to offer more than double uh, what the Cubs ended up giving Imanaga. It's four years, 53 million, including uh, two club or with 2026 and 2027 player options uh, in those. So it's, you know, the the lower end of the deal would be two years and yeah, about 30 million, actually probably even less because it looks like it's nine million, nine and a half million in 2024, 13 and a half million in 2025. Uh, but there is probably more of it with posting fees that have to be paid by the Cubs and whatnot. Um, so this could this could actually be a five year deal technically if if every ag- option is exercised. Um, I think it's an interesting deal for one because you know he clearly chose the Cubs if Heyman's reporting is accurate. Um, Shota Imanaga, in terms of you know statistics, is a guy with excellent excellent strikeout to walk numbers. Uh, but really struggles with a home run ball, and that's in Japan. So it's probably not going to translate very well over in America, where uh, home runs are much, much more prevalent than they are in Japan. You know, if you think if you're giving up homers in Japan, you're going to give up homers in America. Um, but the strikeout to walk numbers are solid. You know, they speak for themselves. I think it speaks to why he was so uh, kind of highly touted coming over uh, in the in the posting process. But uh, you know, the Cubs have been looking to make some moves all offseason. They're still waiting to possibly re-sign Cody Bellinger. Uh, their rotation outside of Justin Steele looks very questionable. They just lost Marcus Stroman. So, Imanag is a guy that, you know, uh, is going to give some innings, you know, can give do some quality innings. It's kind of a wild card because in a lot of cases, you don't always know what to expect with people coming over from foreign countries. But I think it's a solid move for the price they paid. Uh, Yeah, for sure, for sure. And it, it could end up... He could end up being better than uh, Marcus Stroman was uh, for their rotation. Um, you know, yeah, coming over, as you mentioned, the strikeout to walk ratio was very, very good. Uh, 26% strikeout minus walk rate last year, which is, um, you know, MLB average is about 14%. And I imagine it's a little bit lower in Japan also. Um, but yeah, as you mentioned, a high home run rate in Japan Um you know, Japan has a lower home run rate. So the fact that he had a high home run rate against does speak uh, measures there. Um, I read a, a little bit of what uh, Eno Saris wrote about him. Um, and what he talked about was, 
you know, Imanaga had a high amount of ride from his forcing fastball, despite low velocity. Um, so, you know, a, a very high spin rate to, to velocity ratio. Um, and also he described a very good slider and a plus splitter. Um, he's one of those guys that has a lower ground ball rate and higher fly ball rate and probably a, a higher pop-up rate. And he's kind of comparable to someone like Christian Javier, like when he was doing his thing in 2022. Uh, so yeah, it should be interesting. Like the, in, with, uh, with Wrigley Field, they have some parts of their ballpark, which are very pitcher friendly and some parts that are very hitter friendly, you know, left center and right center are very hit, hitter friendly. And I think the deep parts of, uh, you know, down the line each way, is pretty pitcher friendly. So you don't really know if it's, if it, if it's a uh, more benef- beneficial to pitchers or not. So, you know, how, how the home run ball affects him, you know, we'll see about it, but I think those strikeouts and you know, those strikeouts are going to be there. Yeah, no, they absolutely are. Um, Yeah. I mean, it really just feels like a matter of can he keep the ball in the ballpark? Um, And yeah, I mean the, you know, maybe the, uh the wind, maybe the wind will be blowing uh, in towards the pitcher's mound. Uh, on the days where he's pitching and that'll that'll be helpful for him because he is in the windy city but uh you know he feels like uh in in sabermetric terms he feels like a a b-war pitcher yeah right 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 um definitely a little little too many uh long balls to be going there and i'm this is making me curious on what the uh wrigley field stack it's 106 it's 106 i already looked it up 106 so it is a bit hitter yeah, friendly very well that's what it was that's the three-year rolling i believe uh, yeah which is actually, well, actually probably, it's just 20 yeah three-year rolling is probably a little bit more accurate but mm-hmm. nonetheless it's still probably at just generally a hitter's park um but yeah it's it's good to especially knowing that you know stroman's out of there now um it's good that they you know replace that role and still have a guy who he, you could put like two or three in the rotation um so now uh anything more on that signing um no i think that's that's kind of that i mean it's you know it's a helpful it's a helpful addition to the cubs rotation um and yeah the obviously these signings like we said are kind of wild cards you never really know what to uh expect out of them especially when it's not like you know, a top, top of the line guy like Yamamoto, you know, I mean, we've seen guys like Yusei Kikuchi, who has struggled at times, looked good at times. We've seen Kenta Maeda, who's uh, struggled at times, been good at times. Uh, so it, it is kind of hard to say, but I think that this is definitely an upgrade for the Cubs over whatever else they were going to be throwing out there in his place. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I th- Generally speaking, these signings usually end up pretty positive um, mm-hmm. and they usually aren't complete disaster you there, there's rarely ever a time where yeah i feel like i feel like there's no way we're looking at it as like oh my god what a bad contract uh based on you know what he signed for yeah i don't i can't remember an instance where a guy's come over and he's pitched his way out of the league in one year yeah <laughs> you know, no it just hasn't hasn't gone down like that um so so yeah uh Exciting for the Cubs, but they did lose uh, Marcus Stroman, who went to the Yankees. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, inter- you know, pretty pretty decent deal. You know, two years, thirty seven million dollars. Uh, I know Stroman's still in his uh, like early to mid thirties. Uh, what what did you think about this move for the Yankees? Yeah, I mean, Marcus Stroman is you know a uh, a very a controversial personality. Uh, the Yankees are uh, a team that uh you know has big personality and just in the brand itself maybe not in the team necessarily but uh sabermetrically i think this is a really good fit stroman has been a ground ball guy for pretty much his entire career and he really really stepped it up last year specifically the yankees have a plus nine oaa from their infield or at least that's what they had last year so you know i think the fit will be there i think he'll you know give up give the defense a lot of ground balls and they'll do the right thing with it uh at a good rate Right. And, and, uh, you know, as we're talking about, uh, ballpark factors and whatnot, the Yankees, so Yankee stadium has a one sixteen home run park factor, which means, you know, you're just 16% more likely to hit a home run there, but all other factors with singles, doubles, triples, 
they are all like pretty well below average. So if you're not mm-hmm. giving up homers, um, you're in a pretty good spot at Yankee Stadium. Uh, it's just a matter of not giving them up. And Stroman, you know, his fly ball rate is typically below 20%, which is much below league average. Typically doesn't allow a lot of barrels. And, you know, last year his ground ball rate was up near 60%. Uh, so just feel, philosophically, it seems to work out for the for the Yankees. Uh, he's not going to he's not going to dominate on the strikeout and walk number front. Um, you know, I don't think he's going to be anywhere near like the ace of this rotation, but it fills out the rotation pretty well. Uh, they they did have, you know, a situation where you didn't know who their five starter was going to be. It could have been like Luke Week, Luke Weaver, who has a lot of question marks around him, obviously. Um, but with with this, you have now you now the Yankees have, you know, Garrett Cole, Carlos Rodon, Nestor Cortez, Clark Schmidt, and now him. Um, and it seems very, very complete. Yeah, I mean, the Yankees are paying less than the qualifying offer for two years to get a guy that would at the very least make every rotation. Right. I mean, he's a he's a top five starter pretty much on any team. Uh, and that's, you know, even putting it lightly for for most teams, um, because he'd be the best pitcher on some teams. He'd be the third best pitcher on some teams. I'd say he's probably the third best pitcher on the Yankees with uh, Garrett Cole and Carlos Rodon being above him. I'm expecting a bounce back year from Rodon. Um, and yeah, he's not the ace type name that he used to be uh, in his Blue Jays days uh, or even with his, even in the uh, the Mets days. But um, you know, he's still a very solid pitcher. He's going to give you weak contact. Uh, or at least a low barrel rate. His exit velocity was pretty high last year, but um, he's going to give you ground balls. One thing that's very important with him is that his sinker is one of the most effective because it has um, an active spin rate, I believe, uh, that's one of the lowest. I have to check the actual numbers. Um, But active spin is essentially uh, the amount of spin that is causing movement uh, without getting too scientific about it. For sinkers, you want a lower active spin because it makes the pitches drop and it causes more ground balls. Stroman is one of the lowest among all sinkers in baseball. That's that's the best way I could put it without being too scientific. In 2023, his active spin on his sinker uh, was just 60%, which is uh, lower than much lower than the average. Right, right. I think typically the more active spin you have, the less effect gravity has on the ball. So mm-hmm. you want gravity to have, you know, when you're throwing a sinker, you want gravity to have a good effect on the ball. Um, and uh and have it drop so definitely yeah definitely good good to have that especially for a sinker baller and yeah i mean just over the last three years he's been he's been just a solid pitcher at least era wise you know three four five era 122 era plus over the last three years and you know you could say that his performance has technically dropped off a little bit since he signed with the cubs and still even then it's a 116 era era plus which most rotations are going to take it's just a matter of him um, you know, he had, he had, he didn't have a full season at all with the Cubs, um, but he still managed to get over 130 innings, both, both seasons. So, you know, he's, he's going to give you some quality, uh, some, a little bit of innings production. Um, he's not going to, he's not going to, uh, have a, a crazy amount of blow up starts. Um, yeah, he's just a quality piece to have, you know, as a Red Sox fan, I know the, I know the just general, like they, they need more guys and, Stroman is another guy off the list. I would have rather had him than probably Lucas Giolito, who the Red Sox paid more for. But are paying more for, yeah. Um, you know, Giolito does have more upside, but nonetheless, that's that's another another topic for another day. Um, last thing to get into here, just just uh, briefly, uh, Jordan Hicks signs for four years. Was it forty four million dollars with the Giants? Yes. Yeah, it's eleven um, million per year. Yeah, and uh, there's talks of him maybe becoming a starter. Who knows? But uh, what did you think about this move? Um, I mean, I like it for the Giants. We talked about them last week with uh, with the Robbie Ray trade, you know, adding a starter to that rotation. And this does it again uh, with a guy that, you know, I mean, four years is, a pretty, is pretty interesting for a guy that uh, has primarily been a reliever his entire career. They're trying to uh, incorporate as a starter that recently had Tommy John surgery, but uh, he is going into his age 27 season. So, you know, it'll take him up to age 30. So, um, yeah, I mean, I like it. You know, I think it's pretty good value that they can get. You know, it's not going to cripple them. Um, and he's a guy that, you know, he's known for his high velocity, right? I mean, he hit 104 miles an hour when he was with the Cardinals multiple times. Um, but he also very, he fits very perfectly 
with what the Giants pitching philosophy has been in the last few years, especially in 2023, because he's a sinker baller. Uh, he had a 96th percentile ground ball rate last year at 58.9%. That was in 65 and a, in two thirds innings pitched. He also strikes out a lot of guys. He gives up weak contact. It's kind of a combination that you don't see often because normally uh, it's it's not uncommon for guys with high ground ball rates to be kind of sacrificing their strikeout rate because they focus more on weak contact and the right kind of contact. And at the same time, it's uh, it's not common for high strikeout guys to also give up a lot of fly balls because they, they have an overpowering fastball, which usually uh, rises and gets guys underneath the ball. Um, but Jordan Hicks does a combination of both of those things. Yeah, yeah, it, it is very interesting. Yeah, usually um, usually a sinker baller, like sinker ballers typically have higher contact rates, which, you know, drop the strikeout rate, increase the uh, increase the ground ball rate. But yeah, it's it's rare that you have both. Um, Hicks also just philosophically fits with the Giants. Um, we were looking it up uh, just before the show. The Giants last year uh, had the highest ground ball rate, according to Baseball Savant, um, in baseball from their pitchers. Uh, by 4.1 percentage points, they were at 49.6 percent uh, in terms of ground ball rate. The next best team, or the next, the next highest team, was a uh, 45.6 percent. Um, so he fits in with what the Giants sort of have with you know Logan Webb and Alex Cobb at the top of the rotation. Um, so he just seems to fit in pretty well. Uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm kind of interested. Sorry, I'm kind of interested to see what they do with his his pitch arsenal. It's not that you know this won't be the first time. Uh, I mean Jordan Hicks started eight games. Uh, in in a uh, in 2022 with the Cardinals. I don't know if it was as an opener or as a uh, as a traditional starter. It'll be his first time. Uh, starting but it sounds like it's the first time that's that that that's like kind of the plan for him I'm interested to see what they do with this pitch arsenal because he threw a sinker 64 percent of the time last year and he's pretty consistently done that throughout his career I don't know if that's something they're going to let him get away with as a starter because I feel like as a starter you don't kind of just throw out one pitch 65 percent of the time you do it as a reliever but you don't really do it as a starter yeah no definitely yeah definitely not um yeah, and he's never he's never pitched more than five innings uh in a start it looks like so yeah i mean this is going to be essentially a first for him yeah for sure for sure and i mean it's if he can be a consistent starter then that's a giant plus or, or excuse me big plus for the giants <laughs> um a giant plus for the bigs for the yeah giant plus for the, the san francisco the bigs huges. yeah um the but they would get be getting you know hypothetically if you get 130 to 140 quality innings out of him for just 11 million dollars a year that's kind of a steal um considering you know all the starting pitchers that are going off the market right now um so so yeah i mean it it's something that we'll have to we'll have to circle back to when he when he when the season mm -hmm. does start and he is potentially a starter like can he handle it can, can his arm handle it he's a very hard thrower not used to this role. We'll see about it. Um, he's already had, the, yeah, he's already had Tommy John surgery, so probably not going to get it anytime soon. Um, but still, people can still get hurt after their Tommy John surgeries. Um, yeah, I mean, anything more on this deal? Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be interesting to see. Uh, you know, I mean, first of all, like I said, I think he fits perfectly in with the Giants' philosophy. You know, they have a high ground ball rate pretty consistently. They had a forty-nine percent ground ball rate as a staff. Uh, entirely last year Jordan Hicks is going to fit right in with that yeah absolutely um yeah should be fun and it's just generally good to see the Giants uh making deals considering their financial flexibility and uh you know where the direction they should be going in um yeah so I guess that will lead into the positional rankings um and uh do we want to start with uh starting pitchers today yeah, let's start with starting pitchers. Um, this was probably going to be the hardest list to put together out of every position, I think. I had a lot of trouble with it last night. Yeah, I, I had a good bit, you know, I, I had a good bit of thinking to do. Um, and I think part of it is just <clears throat> how we evaluate pitchers can can really vary. Um, yeah, you know, like uh like you know, you don't know, even looking at peripheral statistics, you don't really know what they mean. I, 
sometimes with uh, ERA and FIP differences or ERA and expected ERA differences, they're not really explained sometimes by batted ball data. And sometimes it's just a matter of this guy pitches or this guy pitched much better or much worse uh, in higher leverage situations when there were runners on base, because what those numbers go, go off of a lot is just batter per batter numbers. And obviously like if you, uh, so if you, if you walk the bases loaded and then you strike out the side after and don't allow any runs, your ERA is zero, but your FIP and expected ERA are probably like four or something like that. So imagine that over a longer sample with less extreme numbers, that's kind of what's going on. Some, sometimes just timing, the timing of your good pitching can affect uh, the discrepancies between your ERA and your FIP. And on the other, on the other side of the spectrum, you know, hypothetically a pitcher allows uh, a walk, a home run, and two singles that can be spread out across six innings, you know, scattered, and you can allow one run, or it can be all in the same inning and you allow four runs. The underlying numbers, uh, FIP and expected ERA, they see all they see that in in the same respect. You know, it d- doesn't matter the order. Whereas ERA, you know, it, it's obviously it's it's going to change that. So. Um, that doesn't even have to do anything with like batted ball luck or BABIP or anything like that. It's just a matter of timing. So sometimes, sometimes pitchers have those discrepancies because of that and not even batted ball luck. So it's hard to, hard to evaluate. Um, so anyway, uh, do we want to get into, um, our rankings, our rankings? Let's do it. Uh, what do you got for your number 10 starting pitcher for 2024? Yeah, so this was I had so many close misses. I think I had like sixteen pitchers or so on my big board, and I had to pick six that didn't make it, which was very difficult. I'll go through some of those uh, after we make our list. But at number ten, I have a guy that I think a lot of people might have forgotten about in the last year because he spent a lot of time on the injured list. And with how many good starting pitchers there are, it's, it's pretty easy to to forget about certain guys when they when they're not on the field very much. Uh, like for only uh seventy seven and two thirds innings in a year. But I'm taking Max Freed as my number 10 pitcher uh, in baseball going into 2024. Uh, even in those 77 innings that he pitched last year, Max Freed was kind of amazing. He had a 255 ERA. Um, and, you know, if you look at his uh, his pitch arsenal, he very impressively has a, uh, a four-seam fastball as his primary pitch and yet, again, has a 59.2% ground ball rate and only an 18% fly ball rate. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, forcing fastballs are meant to rise, and because of that, it's meant for hitters to get under them, hit them in the air, probably hit a lot of home runs. And uh, Max Freed did a really good job of preventing that. Uh, in terms of his for his four most used pitches, his highest exit velocity, his highest launch angle was eight degrees. Um, he also had a five point eight percent walk rate last year. Um, he had an eighty six point five percent average exit velocity, and he's also had amazing exit velocity numbers every year since twenty twenty. Um, he's gets, you know, he's always had solid ground ball rates. He only had a 23% sweet spot rate against last year and a 275 expected ERA. Um, you know, I probably would have put him higher on this list if he pitched more last year. And unfortunately, injuries kind of just got to him very early in the season. They stuck with him all the way through. But uh, I think Max Freed uh, is still the really, really great pitcher that he was going into 2023. And I'm going to keep him there going into 2024. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm trying to... um pull up uh the MLB network list just for comparison because they have yep. they have released those. I know he was off of Mike Petriello's personal list. Uh he was in the just missed category. And yeah, uh starting pitcher, I think it goes back a little bit. Um mm-hmm. trying to find here. No catcher. Uh he was number nine. Oh, they did starting MLB. pitcher. Yeah. Yeah he, he was number nine on MLB Network's list. Um for my number 10 I am going with uh the ground god uh Framber ah. Vald- Valdez um you know he he's he has an interesting uh interesting thing about him in, in the last 2 years he has a 3 313 ERA and 328 FIP um which are very very good however I'm kind of alarmed at some of the underlying numbers he had last year uh he hadn't Expected ERA in the 42nd percentile due to a rise in average exit velocity, 
barrel rate, sweet spot percentage, and uh, fly ball rate and line drive rate, you know, jumps in all of those. And it, he had a big drop in ground ball rate. You know, he's great at getting ground balls, but he uh, allowed them 12% less, or he out- allowed them at a rate uh, 12 percentage points below what his rate was in 2022. Um, could be an outline season, I will say. And he's still one of the best innings eaters in baseball. So I still consider him definitely a top 10 pitcher. Uh, but I look at, I, you know, looking at his expected ERA more than his FIP, there's a little bit more concern to be had there. But considering what do you, what his resume, what his resume was, um, you know, heading into last year and how he was still uh, just generally a pretty good pitcher last year, um, especially run prevention wise and FIP wise and how many innings he's been able to get the last two years. Uh, he is still a top 10 pitcher in my mind. Um, what is, uh, yeah. What do you have for number nine? Uh, number nine. I have a guy that was not on MLB networks, top 10 starting pitcher list was not on Mike Petriello's personal list. I don't even know if he was on Mike Petriello's just missed list. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if he's not on your list, but I'm really high on him. And I think he's going to have a career year in 2024. And that's Tyler Glass now, a guy that we talked about uh, recently as he was traded to the Dodgers and extended. Uh, he's only pitched, you know, he only pitched 120 innings last year, the most he's ever pitched in any season of his career. But he had a 291 FIP, the second best in Major League Baseball last year, minimum 100 innings pitched. Uh, he has a solid ground ball rate. He has an excellent strikeout rate. He is a 96 percentile whiff rate at night at 35.3 percent. Um, really, the only thing is that he does get touched up a little bit. Average exit velocity was up. Um, barrel rate and hard hit rate were up uh, last year. But, um, you know, I still think that there's so much potential in that uh, in that arm in a full season. I think he's capable of being a top five pitcher. Uh, in a full season. In fact, last year, uh, his his ground ball rate went from 35% in 2022, and actually I should use 2021 because he pitched more, 45% in 2021 to 50.9% in 2023. If he can keep that up while also having the amazing strikeout to walk numbers he has and the strikeout volume that he has, Tyler Glass now is without any sort of doubt a top 10 pitcher in the league in my book. And I have him at number nine. Uh, I, I'm really betting on a big season for him going into 2024. Yeah, yeah, you know, go, getting away from the Rays who have a that I'm telling you that is going to make him better automatically. Like I can't, you know, there's no actual statistical data to back up why it's better to be not on the Rays, but I mean, look at what happens to their pitchers. It happened to Tyler Glass now. He had Tommy John surgery already. You know, ideally he won't need it again. Um, of course, you know, it's not necessarily the most uncommon thing for guys to have it twice, but I'm gonna go ahead and uh, run under the assumption that he's not right now. Right, right. And w- what we mean by the Rays of poorly affecting pitchers is is health mostly. Uh, they actually, you know, they usually improve pitchers' performance, but at the sacrifice of their health for whatever reason. Um, you know, whereas the Dodgers, I don't think they really have that reputation. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if he if he puts together a qualifying season, that's a guy who it, I think I would predict would get Cy Young votes, uh, not even yeah. just not even say he has the potential to have them. I think. I think if he gets a full season under his belt, that's the guy who's getting Cy Young votes. Um, my number nine, uh, if it if Google Chrome starts working, uh, this is a guy who um, I think I don't think he was on MLB Network's list. I don't think he was on Mike Petriello's uh, list or his just missed list. But he's a guy who I think um, because people are always sort of projecting him to, um, you know regress considering age or just pitching style he's not going to get the recognition for you know projecting him for 2024 but i got sunny gray as my number nine um just because he was of, on mlb network's list oh he was on MLB he was Network's number 10 list? yeah okay that's very good so yeah. i don't have him far from that in uh in number nine uh but you know just the reputation he's built over the past one and a half seasons um it's it's pretty remarkable actually out of 64 pitchers with 200 plus innings since the start of the second half in 2022 sunny gray ranks second in era and third and fit um now i'm not going to say that i'm not going to come out here and say oh he's going to be a top three pitchers p- 
pitcher because of these numbers, but I think he does deserve some recognition as a top 10 pitcher. He's probably due for a little bit of regression in the home run allowance. Uh, I think he had 13 and a half expected home runs allowed as opposed to 10 actual home runs allowed. Uh, and going from Bush, going from, uh, from target, target to field Bush to Bush stadium. stadium, I think will probably negatively affect him a little bit. Um, but he still has a quality strikeout minus walk rate. It's still a quality ground ball rate last year. Uh, that makes him a very good pitcher. And, uh, you know, although he's been around for a while, he's still not old. Uh, he's heading into his age 34 season here. So, and especially for a starting pitcher, that's not a big deal. Um, so yeah, I, I, I still predict some quality pitching from Sonny Gray. I don't think he'll be, you know, a, a Cy Young runner up once again, but I still, I could see him getting Cy Young votes. I could still see him being a pretty quality pitcher for the Cardinals. Um, and that's why I was pretty excited about that signing for them. Uh, what do you have for your number, uh, for your number eight? So for my number eight, I have another uh, the ground god, not the ground god, the ground what like Messiah or something like that. Would that be a step down from God? Yeah, the the ground the the ground Messiah. Uh, I'm gonna go with Logan Webb, uh, who has been a an excellent ground ball pitcher and also just an excellent pitcher in general since the start of 2021. If you've listened to this show for a while, you know that I love Logan Webb. Uh, the thing that I find so interesting about him is that he's changed up the way that he succeeds in the last couple of years. In 2021, the first season where he really broke out, you know, he was a sinker baller that got a lot of ground balls and also, you know, had a good strikeout numbers, good walk numbers, um, and, you know, didn't allow a lot of fly balls. In 2023, he threw uh, a grand total of 1,324 changeups. Uh, he, he's... He threw his sinker uh, about 300 times less, 250 times less. Uh, and he's got a lot of ground balls out of his changeup. Um, he does something that a lot of right-handed pitchers are scared to do. And that's throw a changeup to right-handers. Because changeups ups out of the right-handed arm slot are supposed to move out towards left-handers and in towards right-handers. It's easier to hit generally if you're a right-hander. Logan Webb threw more changeups to right-handers than any other pitcher in baseball last year, and he got a 35% ground ball rate out of right-handers against changeups. That might not sound like a lot. It is a lot. It's actually the highest minimum. Uh, I think it was like a certain amount of batted balls against, uh, I think it was like 100 batted balls uh, against changeups against right-handers by right-handed pitchers. Um, I believe that was a stat, but you know, I appreciate that he isn't afraid to to go into those waters, and he does very well uh, with them. So that is uh, that is why I think Logan Webb is my number eight. Yeah, Logan Webb. So just there's a lot. Like... There's a lot more to it, but that's kind of the special uh, beneath the surface things that I like about him. Yeah, just uh, yeah, just a absolute uh, workhorse the past past couple of years as well. Um, Two hundred sixteen innings pitched last year. Yeah, led led the league there. Um, Cy Young finalist, right? Yes. Yeah. Great. Um, my number eight, uh, is a guy who obviously made a lot of headway, um, in the news this off season, but it's uh, Yoshinobu Yamamoto. Um, some people may, may have him ranked way higher. Some may, some people may have him off the list cause he's, you know, technically unproven in the MLB. Um, but it, you know, it's, it's definitely very, very weird to evaluate, um, pitchers who are coming from other, you know, entirely other leagues, but I just wanted to compare him, just comparing him to other Japanese pitchers um, coming over and how he how he compares to them. Uh, I'm I looked at specifically Kodai Sanga. Kodai Sang- Sanga came over last year. He had a one eight nine ERA and a nineteen percent strikeout minus walk rate the year before he came here, uh, whereas Yoshinobu Yamamoto had a 116 ERA and 22% strikeout minus walk rate along with lower home run allowance. Uh, Kodai Senga despite you know Kodai Senga with those numbers coming over from Japan, he ended up having a pretty good year last year. Not a lot of innings but still finished 7th in the Cy Young and 2nd in rookie of the year. I think Yamamoto has the potential to be better uh in his first year in Japan, maybe even more innings, uh just you know better strikeout walk numbers. Uh, lower run allowance um so i think he just has that potential and uh but still like you know i still hesitate to have him over some of the elite pitchers in the mlb that you know have established themselves in the mlb already um so yeah that's that's my analysis of uh yoshinobu yamamoto yeah so moving on to number seven i have a former cy young winner 
Um, we haven't quite seen those days come back yet, but that's also a very high bar. I have Corbin Burns in my number seven spot. Uh, Corbin Burns is still an ace pitcher, uh, even though he's not quite at his 2021 self. We At least he hasn't really shown it since, but uh, you know he has become a lot more of an innings eater than he was at that point. Uh, and he still dominates kind of all most aspects of pitching. You know, he still has a very good ground ball rate. He still has elite strikeout rate. He gets very good weak contact against him, only an 86.4% average exit velocity against last season. His strikeout to walk numbers, like I mentioned, still very strong. Um, and uh, his cutter has continued to be one of the elite pitches in baseball. He has... Uh, you know, he, he gets a 22% whiff rate off it. That's what he got last year, a 22% put away percent as well. Um, and, you know, he just is continued to uh, dominate all aspects of pitching. Like I mentioned, only a 31% sweet spot rate last year as well. Um, he, you know, the home run ball is a little bit more of an issue for him now than it used to be. Um, but I think that it's kind of almost just something that comes with more innings. Uh, you know, this is kind of how I feel about it. Um, but, Regardless, Corbin Burns is my number seven. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, it's I don't really know what to expect out of, out of Corbin Burns this year. He could he could go back to 2021 form or he could continue to be a worse pitcher. I wouldn't be surprised either way. Um, with my number seven, uh, I am going with the Cy Young finalist from last year, uh, Zach Gallen. Um, I think you know, he had a 3.470 ERA and 3.26 FIP last year. Um, but he is a guy I would describe as a, and I, I just came up with this term, a FIP merchant, um, because his FIP was much lower than his expected ERA. And what that kind of analyzes is, you know, expected ERA keeps track of the batted ball data. FIP does not. I think, and FIP mostly relies on home runs for, you know, the, the batted ball stuff. Uh, whereas expected ERA, it accounts for the fact that he had a pretty um, unfortunate sweet spot rate against and line drive rate against, along with a very high average exit velocity against. Uh, Zach Gellin uh, allowed the, a third percentile average exit velocity, uh, a fifth percentile hard hit rate against, 27th percentile uh, barrel rate against, 27% line drive rate. But ultimately, he's still a top 10 pitcher. Uh, I'm not you know, completely dogging on him here he had a he has a 20 percent strikeout minus walk rate uh over the past two years in 394 innings in those last two years uh so i think he's still definitely a top 10 pitcher but i'm not trying to i'm not hopping aboard him as a top five pitcher um based off of his you know fip numbers the past couple of years um who do you have for your number six so in my number six spot, I think this is really where the hot, the hot takes start coming out. Uh, this guy was on Mike Petriello's list. He was not on MLB's list. I can't imagine he was anywhere close, to be honest. But at my number six, I'm going with Pablo Lopez from the Minnesota Twins. I think Pablo Lopez is maybe the most underrated pitcher in all of baseball. Uh, he definitely showed it last year. You know, he kind of got outshined for a lot of the season in the trade that he was a part of with Luis Arias threatening to hit 400 until June. Uh, but Pablo Lopez had an elite season, uh, especially from June on. Uh, in, in overall last year, 10.86 strikeouts per nine, only 2.23 walks per nine. That's actually uh, his career lowest since 2019. Uh, home run rate was up quite a bit, or not up quite a bit, but it was relatively high. But I think that's largely due to, A, the fact that he had uh, his expected home runs were a lot lower, 19.8 uh, in, in, in 19.8 expected home runs as opposed to 24 actual home runs allowed. Uh, but also the fact that he just throws his four seam fastball a lot, it's naturally going to produce a lot of fly balls, but what it doesn't naturally produce is a lot of swings and misses, but that's what he does. A 31.5% whiff rate against his four seam fastball last year as his primary pitch, his expected numbers on that pitch were a lot better than his actual numbers, bit of misfortune, not going his way last year that kind of kept him from, I think being a lot more recognized for the pitcher that he is. And going into his secondary pitches, he has a sweeper that has a 36.6% uh, whiff rate last year. Uh, a very, very impressive pitch, a 173 batting average against just the 287 slugging against, uh, you know, it, it's it, and also an 81.3% average exit velocity against uh, in 94 batted balls. So, you know, I mean, it's it's a solid secondary pitch, maybe one of the best secondary pitches in all of baseball, his changeup right there with it. 
Um, he dominated the playoffs last year. If you look at his Savant page, he's literally good at everything. <laughs> like everything is at least some shade of red. I think the lowest percentile he's at is at 64% fastball velocity. Uh, but even then, he has 96 percentile extension. So he gets a lot more perceived velocity on that fastball. Pablo Lopez is at my six, which is, is it a hot take? Maybe. Uh, but I, I kind of stand by it. And I would not be shocked if he performs like a top six pitcher this coming season. Yeah, well, especially considering, you know, what he did, uh, what he did last year, I think. In the there's, playoffs. That's, there's just a, there's just a, it's, it's a fair assessment to go based off of that. I mean, 93rd percentile expected ERA is pretty stellar. Um, my number six is Kevin Gossman. Uh, I think a lot of people might have him higher, but I also describe him as a bit of a fit merchant. Um, you know, he's, he has an excellent fit. I think, uh, over the last two years, it's at two, six, eight or something like that. Like that is crazy, crazy good. Um, his ERA, I think is in the low threes over the past few years. Um, and that's because, you know, the FIP is because he has fantastic, uh, strikeout and walk numbers. He, He has the second highest strikeout minus walk rate in the last two seasons, minimum 300 innings pitch. Um, but he also has some bad batted ball metrics, batted ball metrics against him. He had a 20, 20th percentile barrel rate last year, 20th percentile hard hit rate last year. And he, he had a 37% sweet spot rate against, uh, which obviously allows for some more hits to just fall through um, more, you know, more barrels and whatnot. Uh, so, you know, that, prevents him from being a top five pitcher for me. Uh, but I still think, you know, he's a guy who will probably put up a low to mid three ZRA, but I don't think, um, I don't think the FIP accurately represents him necessarily um, to make him, you know, uh, a top three or top five pitcher. Um, who do you have for your number five? Uh, and my number five, you talked about him earlier. This is where I put Yoshinobu Yamamoto. Um, it's very hard to kind of figure out where to put these guys. Um, and I, yeah, I, I decided to put him at five, uh, you know, I maybe, you know, definitely a lot bolder than, uh, yours. I mean, I think there's no, I don't know. It's hard to say what the wrong answer is where how with how to put, how to evaluate Yamamoto right now. Uh, I'm loading up his baseball reference page because his fan graphs is not, uh, loading right now, but I mean, he won the the Japanese equivalent of the uh of the Cy Young, uh, in the last three seasons over in Japan. You know, I mean, this is the most hype we've seen, uh, for a Japanese import since Shohei Otani. And I mean, I think you got to remember what that hype was like for Otani back in 2017. I know this is all anecdotal, but I uh, you know it was impossible for him to live up to it, and he has. And Yamamoto, I think the way that they're hyping him up, they're talking about him like he's a top five pitcher in baseball. Um, and I mean, if you look at the stats, they all show it. I mean, a 116 ERA last year in Japan and 171 innings pitched, 6.29 strikeouts per walk. Uh, <laughs> my favorite, I mean, two home runs allowed in 171 innings pitched. You know, if that if that translates proportionately in America, he's going to be, you know, one of the best at preventing home runs in baseball while also being one of the most elite at strikeout to walk ratios. Um, I think, you know, it's hard. Like I said, it is very hard to evaluate a guy that's never thrown a pitch in major league baseball, but you know, we do still, we have seen him against, against major league hitters in the world baseball classic. And I mean, we saw um, Japan win the world baseball classic last year and we saw Yoshinobu Yamamoto dominate those hitters. So there's no reason to believe he can't dominate uh, American hitters the same way. Yeah, for sure. For sure. That Yoshinobu Yamamoto is, you know, on this list, like he probably has some of the highest like variants on where people are, are putting him with, you know, yeah, they could have, him if t- people are putting him at all. Yeah. They could have him top three if they're really, really optimistic about him. Um, and yeah, like if he comes out and wins a Cy Young in his first year, like, it might be a little bit surprising, but nothing, nothing off the radar necessarily. Um, so my number five, um, staying in the NL West, uh, someone you previously talked about, uh, talking about Logan Webb uh, for number five. A lot of this just has to do with his innings production. Uh, he's a true workhorse with the third most innings pitched in the last two seasons. And then also just a very, very quality pitcher 
309 ERA and 310 FIP in the last two seasons. Uh, you know, obviously a, a ground messiah as we as we're putting him. <laughs> uh, out of 67 pitchers with 750 plus batted balls in the last two seasons. He has the second highest ground ball rate, second lowest sweet spot rate, and fifth lowest line drive rate out of 67, and also had a 19% strikeout minus walk rate uh, last season, which is, you know, five percentage points above league average. So great strikeout minus walk numbers while having great, um, you know, sweet spot ground ball line drive numbers. Um, And that's made him an excellent uh, an excellent pitcher having, you know, a 309 ERA, 310 FIP in the last two seasons. Um, so yeah, I, I, you know, very, very optimistic about Logan Webb, obviously also, you know, pretty young heading into his age 27 season. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm liking what I'm seeing out of Logan Webb and I think he'll continue that, uh, heading into 2024. Um, who do you have as, as your number four? So at number four, I have a guy that you mentioned earlier. Um, I'm talking about Kevin Gosman. You had him at six, I believe. Yeah. And uh, I think the thing that really impresses me about Kevin Gosman, and I think the reason why I had him a little bit higher than you did, is that all of his successes have come basically with just two pitches. You know, as a starter, as I kind of mentioned earlier with Jordan Hicks, it's very hard to – uh, it's very hard to get by as a starter without a very diverse pitch arsenal. And Kevin Gosman in 2023 had his four-seam fastball and his split-finger fastball account for almost 90% of his pitches thrown. Uh, he did throw a slider and a sweeper uh, very briefly, um, but there was, you know, they didn't even get that very good results, and they were about 10% of his uh, of his total pitch usage. So. You know, he kind of gets away with doing something that you're not supposed to get away with. You know, I think there's a lot of you have to be very talented to have two pitches get you by like that as a starter. And yeah, excellent FIP numbers over the last couple of years. A 2.68 FIP, you mentioned a 2.38 FIP in 2022, uh, which was outstanding. You know, yeah, one of the best FIP pitchers in all of baseball, even with like volume. You know, he's pitching 180 innings a season right now, uh, maybe even up to 190 at some points as well. Um and yeah, I mean, the splitter is one of the best pitches in all of baseball. Um, it's very hard to find a guy sort of like that. And I think I put a lot of stock into that. And it almost feels like he could be more talented with a third pitch. Uh, so, and I, it, it's that's not necessarily the right thing to evaluate, you know, because you don't know if he's getting one or not. And he's also been good without it. Uh, but I really am impressed by Kevin Gosman's ability to uh to pitch with such a limited arsenal to that degree of success so for that reason i have him at number four yeah right 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 um my at number four um might i might with this ranking i might be uh underrating him or accord, at least according to a lot of people but i think he's due for a little bit of regression uh however my number four is garrett cole um he's you know one of his best assets is he's another true workhorse like like Logan Webb. He is the second most innings pitch in the last two seasons, uh, along with that low ERA and FIP numbers in the last two years with a 305 ERA and a 331 FIP. Um, what I'm concerned about with Garrett Cole uh, and why I think he's due for a little bit of regression is uh, there was a big drop in whiff rate and strikeout rate last season, despite him, you know, obviously winning the Cy Young. Uh, his underlying numbers uh, in some ways got a little bit worse. Uh, his whiff rate dropped eight percentage points and his strikeout rate dropped five percentage points and his average four seam velocity dropped 1.1 miles per hour. Um, and, you know, there's a little bit, you know, I think he's heading into his age 32 or 33 season. So age is maybe catching up to him a little bit there, maybe causing him to strike out less guys and and throw a little, uh, throw a little less hard. Um, he also just had some batted ball luck that probably won't carry over. Uh, he had the third luckiest difference in slugging and expected slugging and the second luckiest difference in batting average and expected batting batting average out of 59 pitchers. So if you're wondering why I have him number four instead of, you know, number one after being um, arguably the best pitcher in baseball last year, uh, that's why that's why I have him. Uh, number four, because I'm projecting for, for 2024 for him to regress back to the mean, mean a little bit. I don't think he'll have a four year, a, but it's probably going to be low to mid threes um, as opposed to some of the guys I have him above some of the guys I have above him uh, on this list. Uh, who do you have for number three? 
And number three, I do have Garrett Cole. So, I mean, we're kind of on the same page there. The reason I didn't put him number one were a lot of the similar reasons that you just talked about with his, uh, his you know, declining strikeout rate, declining whiff rate. But uh, I'll use this to talk more about, you know, why he's number three and rather rather than why he's not two or one. Because, yeah, I mean, Garrett Cole was the Cy Young winner for a reason. He had a, he had a whip under one uh, last year. And I think Garrett Cole has just been probably the best model for consistency that we've seen in baseball. Uh, for a long time, he's uh, outside, you know, excluding, uh, excluding 2020, he's had at least five F4 in every season other than 2021, which was just a year, or excuse me, 2022, uh, which was just a year where he had some really tough home run luck. He had a 277 X FIP that year. Uh, so, I mean, in the home run luck, you know, it, it became a little more fair for him last year. You know, I mean, maybe even a little bit more on the luckier side, but uh, regardless, you know, he was, uh, a guy that, you know, sort of went out there on a rotation where he was expected to do everything last year uh, and and did it to the best of his ability. You know, even at age uh, 32, he had excellent, fa- you know, solid fastball velocity, even though he did lose a mile per hour on his fastball uh, since last year. But his secondary pitches uh, are all excellent. His slider had a 185 batting average against last year uh, and a, a 250 uh, slugging. So, like, you know, that was – that was really good for him. And uh, that was one of the best pitches, uh, you know, 10 run value out of a secondary pitch is very hard to do. Uh, and he's done it for two, for three straight years, four straight years, uh, full years on his slider. So, I mean, I feel, still think it's one of the best secondary pitches in all of, of baseball. Um, his curveball, his change up, his cutter, obviously not used to uh, any severe degrees, 12, 12% or less, but, you know, all of them get the job done. Every single one of his pitches had a whiff rate above, 22 percent last year and every one of his secondary pitches had a whiff rate above 24 percent uh because naturally if you throw the four seam fastball that much uh the whiffs are kind of limited in most cases but uh garrett cole still does a very good job of that and uh, i do have him as my number three you know i didn't put him at two or one because of the reasons you mentioned but he's still a top three pitcher for you a top four pitcher yeah absolutely you know <clears throat> You're you're not gonna have a, a two six three. Well, sometimes you have a two six three uh, ERA by accident, but you're not gonna yeah. win Cy Young by accident. Um, you're not gonna have a not in twenty twenty three. Not not in twenty twenty three. In like the in like the nineties and early two thousands, yes, you are. But yes, not not in twenty twenty three. Um, and you're not gonna you're not gonna lead in innings by accident. Uh, and have a you know still good peripheral numbers. You know a three. I think it was a three four eight expected ERA. Very very good FIP as well. Um, you know, he's, and still, despite the drop in strikeout rate and whiff rate, still very good strikeout to walk numbers. So, um, obviously, you know, uh, I think I just, yeah, you, you, you have to, when you're, when you're ranking the Cy Young winner, number four, you do have to explain a little bit of why you're putting him number four and not number one or two. Um, but definitely still definitely a a top five pitcher. Uh, my number three Um, I think some people also might say I'm underrating this guy as well, um, considering his strikeout and walk numbers, but I'm talking about Spencer Strider as my number three. Uh, he is obviously the best strikeout pitcher in the game. Uh, he's likely going to lead in strikeout minus walk rate again this year. Um, and what I'll say about his differences in ERA and expected ERA and ERA and FIP, I think that can be explained a lot by worst performance with runners in scoring position. Um, his career strikeout rate with runners in scoring position is 33% as opposed to 38% in all of the situations. And he has a 10% barrel rate with runners in scoring position as opposed to a 6% with the bases empty and a 3% uh, home run rate with runners in scoring position as opposed to a 2% home run rate in all this, all other situations. So what I'm trying to say there is, uh, I think the differences between his ERA and his peripheral numbers are because of that timing thing that we talked about, which is, you know, he, he, he'll have his walks and home runs, but a lot of them will happen in like the same inning. Uh, and that's a lot of the reason for his ERA and FIP differences is not necessarily bad at ball luck. In fact, uh, despite his discrepancy in ERA and FIP, as well as ERA and expected ERA, his difference in WOBA and expected WOBA over the last two years is only one point. So it's not bad at ball data. It's a timing issue. And I think part of it has to do with him. He probably just pitches worse out of the stretch 
which is why he pitches worse with runners in scoring position. So um, yeah, it's, it's something interesting. However, uh, you know, that's just my analysis into the intricacies of it. Nonetheless, he's still probably going to be a, uh, ERA in the threes type guy, still one of the best strikeout walk pitcher or still the best strikeout walk pitcher in the game. Um, and I've, I'm also, uh, encouraged by his increase in innings production last year. He had 186 innings last year. So I still think he, I still think he will have a lower ERA than he did last year. I just don't think it's going to be like, um, a, a, as big of a difference as a lot of people think. Um, what do you have, uh, what do you have for your number two? Yeah, I mean, we're just repeating it ourselves at this point because I have Spencer Strider at my two. Um, yeah, I mean, he's the best strikeout to walk pitcher in the game, the best strikeout pitcher, certainly. I think it's really Doug goes kind of under the radar how good he is at not walking people, though. You know, I know 62nd percentile walk rate in last year doesn't really stand out, but when you throw as hard as he does on a consistent basis, when you have a slider that moves uh, as well as his slider does, it's not uncommon for guys to just not know where it's going, but he knows exactly where it's going and he's able to locate for the most part, pretty well. Um, the stuff on it is obviously excellent. You know, he's kind of the face of like stuff plus uh, all the Eno Saris numbers that are, that are out there on fan graphs. Um, you know, the reason I don't have a number one is because of some of the batted ball data, you know, a 40% sweet spot rate last year is not something that I love. Um you know, I mean, these guys do make the, you know, on the, on the rare occasion where guys make contact, they are pretty good at making the right kind of contact. Um, but also, you know, the exit velocity is like, all right. Um, the barrel rate, you know, guys do kind of uh, get to him a little bit, but I mean, it's hard to ignore the strikeout rate that he put up last year, 36.7%, I believe, 36.8% uh, last year. It's, you know, and just in his, you know, his second season uh, entirely, you know, it is, something that's kind of absurd and uh yeah he's the number two pitcher in baseball in my opinion yeah and to piggyback <clears throat> excuse me piggyback off of your point of the low walk rate like the reason i think a lot of guys who strike out um batters at the rate that strider does have a higher walk rate than strider does typically is because yeah like you know he's not having he's most of his like he, he's not getting as many like first pitch outs or second pitch outs as the other uh, as the other uh, pitchers are because he's um, he has such great swing and miss stuff and guys aren't you know guys aren't making as much contact obviously so he's going to have longer plate appearances which opens up for walks more but obviously he's not um, he hasn't had that that high walk rate that would probably come with uh, a higher strikeout rate like he does especially you know. He's the best. He's far and away the best uh, strikeout pitcher uh, among starting pitchers in the game. Um, yeah. So my number two is probably your number one. Um, but uh, my number two is Zach Wheeler. He's just been a real model of consistency. He is the second best FIP in baseball over the last three years, minimum 400 innings. Uh, but he also has like the expected numbers that backs up that FIP and makes it um, makes it very legitimate. He has the third best expected WOBA against in the last two years, uh, minimum five uh, 5,000 pitches thrown. And he's pitched more innings than the pitchers ahead of him in FIP and uh, expected WOBA, like I mentioned. Um, and uh, just, yeah, he's, he's extremely consistent peripherally. You know, his ERA jumped a little bit, but some of that just had to do with, you know, poor timing and whatnot. Um, he has been 80th percentile or better in expected ERA each of the last three years and 80th percentile or better in average exit velocity uh, each of the last three years. Um, he's been top 10 in strikeout minus walk rate uh, each of the last three years as well, minimum 150 innings pitch, and he's had 150 innings or more uh, each of the last three years as well. So he's been consistently pretty healthy. He had a little bit of an IL stint in 2022, but nothing that... Uh, held him out for too long. Uh, he has great strikeout minus walk, uh, great strikeout and walk numbers each and every year, and also great like average exit velocity numbers each and every year, which you can't say about a lot of strikeout pitchers, but he has those, which is uh, which is pretty rare, a pretty rare combination. But you know, he's he's just been he's just very very consistent. Um, and you know, I I feel I have no problem with him, or I have no problem believing that he'll be an elite pitcher once again this year. 
Yeah, so for my number one, I do indeed have Zach Wheeler. Yeah, another model of consistency, like you mentioned. The thing that really impresses me about him is that over the last three years, when he's really been like the true ace of the Phillies, the guy that they signed to that contract before the 2020 season, his batted ball profile against has been, he's gone through like every possible phase. In 2021, he had a 50% ground ball rate, a, a 16% li- a fly ball rate, 24% line drive rate. His line drive rate, I'm actually going to ignore it because it's been pretty similar throughout the years. And he finished second in Cy Young. A lot of people think he should have won that Cy Young. And they gave it to Corbin Burns, who had a lot less innings pitched, but a generational fifth season, as I have always like to say. In 2022, he was, you know, just as good. Uh, but with a 46% ground ball rate, it went down by four and a half percent. A 23 and a half percent fly ball rate, it went up by seven percent. Guess what? Still an excellent pitcher. And then in 2023, a 41% ground ball rate below the league average went from 50% to 41% within two years, a 26% fly ball rate. His fly ball rate went up almost 10% between the two years. His pop-up rate uh, went from 5.5% in 2022 to 9.1% in 2023. And if it wasn't for his bat- his batting average on balls in play against uh, with runners in scoring position, I think he would have won the Cy Young last year. He threw 192 innings. Um, he had 212 strikeouts, a 5% walk rate, 5.1% barrel rate. Uh, there's just not, you know, again, there's not a single uh, place where he doesn't excel. And you can even point to his ground ball rate as a place where he doesn't excel. But guess what? He's been there, done that. He's already succeeded with a high ground ball rate. Now he's doing it with a low ground ball rate. It's the kind of guy where you don't really have to worry about what his ground ball rate, where what his uh, batted ball profile looks like, because he's going to succeed no matter where everyone's hitting at. And this is also with the Phillies defense behind him. Uh, so, you know, that kind of plays into the role of like, hey, no matter where they're, you know, he's getting the guys out, he's getting the innings in, uh, no matter how they're hitting the ball. And he's not giving up home runs at a high rate, even with a high fly ball rate, uh, which is terrific because those are the easiest kinds of outs to get. Uh, it was a very tough process of finding this list. There's a lot of guys who could make a case for it, number one. Uh, but I put Zach Wheeler at one. I feel pretty good about it. I think he's the best pitcher in baseball going into 2024. Now I want to hear this hot take. Yeah, this is, uh, it, yeah, especially considering like, okay, I have Wheeler, Cole, and Strider, like two, three, and four. Two, three, four. Or, is or, it, or, I, I feel like I have, a, I have two guesses. Okay. All right. Uh, was 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 this person on my list? Yes, I, I know who exactly who it is. Okay, so yeah, we we talk about consistency. Um, he isn't on the health front, or at least last year he was not consi- He he wasn't consistently on the on the mound, but I don't think it's gonna linger, and I think he's gonna put together a full season. Um, but uh, like this guy's been really really consistent and kind of been sneaking under people's radars, but. The best pitcher for 2024 for me is Max Freed. Uh, out of 74 pitchers with 400 plus innings since the start of 2020, Freed's ERA ranks first and FIP ranks fourth. His ERA has never eclipsed 3.04 in these four years, and his FIP has never been over 3.31. Uh, out of 58 pitchers with 1,250 plus batted balls since the start of 2020, he is the lowest average exit velocity and barrel rate and the second lowest expected slugging and slugging against behind Corbin Burns, who has not been as effective uh, in uh, as recently. Um, and Max Freed also has the fifth highest ground ball rate on that list of 58. So along with soft contact, he's also getting good contact with his high ground ball rate. With runners in scoring position since 2020, Max Fried has a 57% ground ball rate and 83.5 average exit velocity. That leads to him having a 181 average against and 194 expected batting average against with runners in scoring position in this span and a 237 slugging against and 261 expected slugging against with runners in scoring position. And out of 91 pitchers with 1,250 plus pitches, uh, with runners in scoring position since 2020, Freed has the lowest slugging and expected slugging with runners in scoring position, which partially explains those ERA and expected ERA differences and ERA and FIP differences. It's not really a matter of batted ball luck. His BABIP has, or his, his overall BABIP against has been fairly average. Um, in the last two years, 
out of 74 pitchers with 250 plus innings pitch. Max Fried is the only pitcher with an ERA and FIP both in the top three. And uh, also in 2023, he was 91st percentile in average exit velocity and 97th percentile in expected ERA and barrel rate. So he's been an elite pitcher. I think, I think his uh, injury last year, you know, made people sort of, uh, so it made people forget about him a little bit because, you know, he wasn't uh, obviously in any Cy Young conversations, but when he came back and, and was healthy, he was still an amazing pitcher and he was as amazing a pitcher as he had been the previous three years. And he's, he just has a long track record of success. Uh, he's heading into his age 30 season, I think. So it's not like he's and going getting, into free agency too. Yeah. He- heading into a contract year um, and just has been really, really good for a while. And uh, if he's staying on the mound, which there's no reason to really suggest that he isn't going to, um, I think he, you know, there's a reason why, why we both picked him Cy Young last year. Like he's, he's one of the best pitchers in the game. Um, So yeah, that is, uh, that's my, that's my hot take. That's what no one else is saying is Max. No one else is saying it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it's probably an accomplishment that I even had him top 10. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Look, I mean, you and I both picked him to win NL Cy Young last year. And obviously the reason he didn't win, it was because he didn't get hit because he got injured and he got injured very quickly, but his performance didn't give us any reason to deviate from why we picked him to be the Cy Young. You know, I mean, for me, like there are so many good starting pitchers out there to where it's very easy to kind of let go of people that didn't pitch a lot last year. Uh, you know, I thought, you know, just putting him in top 10 was a, was service to being like, Hey, just remember this guy's still out there. You know, he did only pitch 77 innings last year, but you know, it's hard. You'd be, it's hard to find a pitcher that you would take their 77 innings over his 77 innings, because if you covered up all his numbers outside of innings pitched last year, you'd say, yeah, that's Cy Young quality work right there. Right. And, you right. Know, obviously innings pitch do matter, but, uh, you know, he, he was kept off the field, unfortunately but his performance gave every reason to believe that he's still an elite pitcher. Yeah, exactly. Like, uh, and it's something where I'm not like, obviously I think he sneaks under the radar, but I couldn't even really get too mad at like MLB network for having him nine, having him 10, because I initially I was like, wow, wow. They're putting, they're putting this guy ahead. But I was like, Oh yeah, I could definitely see a case for Logan Webb above him or Kevin Gosman mm-hmm. or Zach Gallon above him. I could see even case, Yamamoto. I could see a case for Yamamoto and then obviously Strider Cole and, and Wheeler. I could definitely see a case for having them above him. But I think uh, you know, some something that like doesn't get accounted for with the FIP and expected ERA numbers are his elite his elite approach with runners in scoring position. He just seems to allow way softer contact and just does way better um, when the pressure's on. And that's over a four year span. It's not necessarily a small sample. And that's why he has, you know, since 2020 uh, out of pitchers with 400 plus innings since then he has the best ERA. Um, And uh, you know, that could, that could very well continue as we, uh, if he has a full year in 2024. So yeah, it's something I'm excited about. I'm excited about his free agency when that comes up. Um, I'm sure that uh, that Braves deal when he does get, that Braves extension, you know, that four year, thirty million dollar extension will be will be very one <laughs> nice. percent going to the Atlanta Braves Foundation. Yeah, yes, very much so. Um, so yeah, that does it for starting pitchers. Uh, I yeah. guess. By the way, and before we go into right fielders, I was scrolling through MLB Network's uh, like lists to get to theirs, and they put I found their shortstop list. They put Willie Adamas over Bobby Witt Jr. That's crazy. That's that's a rough take. That is rough. That um, is a rough take. Or actually, let's go one through ten with our list. What's, yeah. what's your one through ten? So my number ten is Max Fried. My number nine is Tyler Glass. Now my number eight is Logan Webb. My number seven is Corbin Burns. My number six is Pablo Lopez. My number five is Yoshinobu Yamamoto. My number four is Kevin Gosman. My my number three is Garrett Cole. My number two is Spencer Strider, and my number one is Zach Wheeler. Yes, and my number ten is Framber Valdez. Uh, number nine is Sonny Gray. Number eight Yoshinobu Yam- Yamamoto. Number seven Zach Gallen. Uh, number six, Kevin Gosman. Uh, number five, Logan Webb. Number four, Garrett Cole. Number three, Spencer Strider. Number two, Zach Wheeler. Number one, Max Freed. Um, 
something I was surprised with, uh, especially with you're, you're someone who likes to look at uh, fielding and independent pitching a lot. I'm surprised you didn't have uh, Zach Gallon on your list. Uh, he was one of my close misses. I have everyone that was on your list that wasn't on mine was a close miss. I think Gallon, I put it like number 12. Uh, yep. Sonny Gray was my number 11. But like I also looked at George Kirby. I looked at Targ Skubal, believe it or not. I looked at uh, Fran Valdez. Um, there were some others as well. Luis Castillo. Like there were a lot of really tough calls for me to make on this one, but yeah, Zach Allen was very close for me. At the expected ERA, uh, it kind of kicked him off, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, no, very. Because I mean, all, so. all these guys have very good FIP numbers, uh, you know, to be on this list because that is kind of what I look at. Um, but yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I left uh Corbin Burns off the list, which uh I think yeah. a lot of people would still have him as a top ten pitcher. Um, my concern is with a is with his consistent drop in strikeout rate and ground ball rate um obviously he's not going to replicate 2021 but still like his strikeout rate or his uh strikeout minus walk rate has gone from 30 percent to 24 percent to 17 percent and his ground ball mm-hmm. rate has gone from 50 percent to 48 percent to 44 percent so i he could bounce back and get back to like even 22 22 status yeah but- yeah. The way he's been trending, I'm wondering if that's just going to keep going down. He did uh, have like a very strong finish last season, which I think is why I put him on. I do remember like in the last couple months, he really like turned kind of turned it back. Uh, even to like some like he had some 2021 style starts uh, towards the end there. He had a 335 fit from July 1st on. Uh, which is a lot better, obviously, than what he did have. I feel like for uh, for right field. There's a very consensus top five, like maybe not a consensus order, but a very consensus list of the five best right fielders. I did put in the notes, like there's a significant gap between number five and number six. Number six. Yep. Um, Whatever order that may be in. Uh, Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if we have the same top five in order to be completely honest. Um, You want to start this one? uh, Yeah, sure. Um, Yeah. You started starting pitchers. So I will go ahead and start with right fielders where I have, sort of a legacy guy at number 10 um not the greatest year last year but just has you know he's due to sort of bounce back even though he's a little bit on the older side i'm talking about george springer um he's still a solid player but drops in average exit velocity barrel rate defensive performance and speed have taken him out of the elite conversation uh in my opinion uh he had the lowest barrel rate and home run rate of his career in 2023 which resulted in the lowest slugging and OPS of his entire career. Um, However, still looking at it, maybe on the longer term scale uh, in the last two seasons, he has still had a a 116 OPS plus and relatively average defense. So I still think he's a quality player, Um, even though he's heading into his age, I think 34 or 35 season, there still could be a potential bounce back. I know he uh, underperformed his expected numbers a little bit as well. Um, So yeah, I still think, I still have him top 10, but I could easily see a case for him being outside the top 10. Um, who do you have number 10? Yeah, George Springer. I'll just spoil this right now. He was my number 11. Uh, uh, yeah, I was very close. Uh, my number 10, uh, I feel like this is a guy that you had as a player to watch at one point. I could be wrong, though. Uh, it is Anthony Santander from the Baltimore Orioles. Did you have him as a player to watch? No, you didn't. No, he was he was fool. He was one of uh. I know he was. I know he was one of Bailey's guys. Okay, I don't know why I feel like. Anyway, I put Anthony Santander. Um, you know, he had another a pretty good year offensively, kind of a a very on par year to what he's had, uh, throughout the course of his career. He hits the ball very well, very hard. Uh, gets it in the air a lot, which is very good as a right-handed hitter in Baltimore. Um, he had a 32% fly ball rate last year as a left-handed hitter for the Orioles. Uh, the, the only reason I didn't put him a little higher on this list is because his, his line drive rate dropped from 23% to 19.6%. Um, you know, I feel like that did kind of make a big difference there because the others went to ground balls with his 33%, 33rd percentile sprint speed, excuse me. Um, you know, I mean, he's always been a very – He's kind of been a very consistent bat for the Orioles over the last couple of years. He had an OPS just below 800 in 2023. Very good power. Um, you know, not the greatest at strikeout to walk ratio, but he's like somewhat close to major league average, I would say, on that front. Um, fielding, he's been meh in, in right field, but you know, he's been a very good offensive bat. I think he takes advantage of that right field wall in Baltimore very well. And I have him scraping this list at number 10. 
Right, right. Um, I think maybe where you may have heard me talking about him extensively was where we both had him was the uh, all MLB underrated team. That's that's where you had him. Yep. Yeah. Um. Yeah. He was both. He was in both of our outfields. Um. And uh, before I get to number nine, something I probably should have said earlier is like when we're doing these rankings, we're projecting for next season. So a lot of what we talk about are going to be underlying numbers as opposed to on the surface stats. So we're going to be talking a lot about strikeout to walk rate or strikeout and walk rates, chase rate, walk rate, um, average exit velocity, barrel rate, sweet spot rate, expected statistics. And for pitchers like FIP. Uh, we're going to use that more than like on the surface numbers, which is average on base percentage slugging OPS ERA. And that's just because it's generally a better predictor of what the next season is going to bring than those on the surface numbers. For example, uh, like Paul Goldschmidt last year. So in 2022, he dramatically outperformed his expected numbers in 2022. Um, but then his OPS dropped 161 points the next year, despite his underlying numbers staying about the same. He just had like more his his underlying numbers were just more in line with his actual numbers in in 2023 and then like Jeff McNeil and Andres Jimenez also had much worse offensive years uh last year after greatly outperforming their expected numbers in uh in 2022 and then on the other uh, on the other end of the spectrum Corey Seager and Max Kepler had huge bounce back seasons after years in which they underperformed their expected numbers so that's why a lot of the time we we won't reference like straight up a guy's, you know, average and OPS. We'll just talk mm-hmm. about like, oh, their strikeout walk numbers were better last year, or they hit the ball harder, or they had more barrels, because that's what's going to translate more than, you know, the on, on the surface numbers. So that's why we kind of reference a lot of the numbers that we do. But that transitions into my number nine right fielder, who is uh, Max Kepler, one of those guys who had a bounce back year. Um, His slugging jumped 136 points last year. His OPS jumped 150 points last year. Also had a 2.8 mile per hour jump in average exit velocity and 5.1 percentage point jump in barrel rate. And uh, in 2023, he was 75th percentile or better in chase rate, whiff rate, barrel rate, hard hit rate, average exit velocity, expected batting average, expected slugging, expected WOBA, and outs above average while having an above average sweet spot and line drive rate. So he was all red everywhere on the baseball's Avant spectrum, whether it was offensively or defensively. So uh, I love what uh, Max Kepler brought to the table. I think the only thing that's preventing me from ranking him higher is like base running numbers. He's not as up to par as some of the guys I have above him. And also he's uh, he's a little older than some of the guys I have uh, directly above him, but what do you have? Who do you have as your uh, as your number nine? So number nine, I have a guy that really broke out last year. Kind of went from an unknown to a guy that is obviously on one of these lists. Josh Lowe from the Tampa Bay Rays. When you look at Josh Lowe on fan graphs from last year, he has kind of the making of a guy you'd expect to regress uh, next year. He had you know a twenty four point eight percent strikeout rate, a six point two percent walk rate, not the strongest walk to strikeout ratios. A 357 Babbitt, which is not, you know, doesn't feel sustainable over, um, you know, a qual, you know, he didn't qualify last year. He only had 501 plate appearances. So, you know, in a qualifying season, not sure if it's something that would, uh, you know, <laughs> it's be sustainable. But uh, if you look at his Savant page, he actually was kind of on par with how he should have been. Uh, he hit 292 last year. His expected batting average was 276. He slugged 500 last year. His expected slugging was 480. Uh, and, you know, mind you, this is with uh, strikeout and walk rates considered uh, because, a, you know, a strikeout is automatically a zero on the X batting average and the X slug. And he did it quite a lot last year, uh, but the expected numbers still suggested he was very good. You know, I think that kind of speaks to his batted bro- ball profile. Um he had a 36% sweet spot rate last year, good for 69th percentile. Um, he had very good sprint speed. Uh, defense struggled. He struggled a bit. He actually had very good base running numbers, a 7 BSR, 2.1 BSR last year in, in just shy of 200 plate appearances. Uh, yeah, everything about Josh Lowe kind of took me by surprise because, you know, you look at his performance, and you're like, wait a minute, that guy put up a 130 weighted runs created plus. You go to Savon, it's like, oh, yeah, he did, and he kind of deserved it, actually. Um, you know, he he had a high fly ball rate last year in a Tropicana field, which is uh, pretty friendly for, for pull side hitters. Um, generally speaking, whether you're 
uh, whether you're lefty or righty. He actually went straight away more than anything else last year, um, which is good uh, for, uh, you know, which is good for batting average, um, even good for slugging to a degree too. But um, yeah, I mean, Josh Lowe is a guy that I wasn't, ex- I was kind of expecting to kick off this list, uh, but I ended up putting him at number nine because I think there is uh, some sustainability to his performance. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And uh we'll double down here because I have him number eight and uh we can talk about him even a little bit more. Um Josh Lowe, yeah, he's he's a very interesting player. Um I I don't think a lot of people know about him yet, but he was he was a very quality player last year. He has and this goes to the uh, non qualifying thing, him missing uh him having one less plate appearance than the qualifier, <laughs> yeah. but he had the only non-qualifying season in <laughs> baseball history with 20 oh my god 30 plus doubles and 30 plus stolen bases. Um yeah, yeah, dude. Was, not not qualifying. He did it, he did it in just 501 plate appearances. Yeah, he, he had a very small sample size to get those 20 <laughs> home runs, 30 doubles, and 30 stolen bases. But nonetheless, like very, very impressive. Uh he also like he he was kind of on par with his expected numbers and, but still outpour, outperformed them a little bit, but you can expect that when you have an 86th percentile sprint speed, like he's a very fast runner. That's why he was able to get 32 stolen bases. And uh, along with that, uh, you know, still had the, still had a 68th percentile expected woe, but 81st percentile expected slugging. And uh, for me, um, why I have him ahead of Max Kepler is his base running edges him out for me. Um, because he stole 32 bases and only got caught three times. That's really, really good. Uh, even though Kepler has a little bit more better of a batted ball profile, I think Lowe's um, base running uh, puts him over for me, as well as his youth a little bit too. I think he's heading into his age 26 season or something like that. Um, who do you have as your number eight? Number eight, I have a guy. I feel like this guy is almost too good to be at number eight with his batted ball profile. But, you know, I mean, I do think there are seven right fielders better than him. I have Seiya Suzuki from the Chicago Cubs in my number eight spot. If you look at his batted ball profile from last year, uh, it's kind of hard to find any flaws. You know, he first of all, he has a 28 percent career line drive rate between 2022 and 2023. The major league average is around 25 percent. So 25 to 28 might not seem like a crazy difference, but over a large sample size, it actually is. And it's not even really coming at the expense of fly balls uh, because he had a 24 percent fly ball rate last year uh 24.6 percent overall that's actually above the league average and his ground ball rate has been below the major league average over his career and even then he has a 79th percentile sprint speed so it's not like ground balls are the end of the world for him uh but he has a 36 percent sweet spot rate like uh low who i previously mentioned a 48 percent hard hit rate last year a uh, very good expected batting average very good expected slugging he had a 91.4 percent average exit velocity a 10 percent walk rate a 72 percent whiff rate a 91st percentile chase rate the only thing he did not greatly was that he struck out 22 percent of the time which is around the major league average but you know it's pretty forgivable when you do everything else to to that extent defense and base running on fan graphs were uh a bit of a struggle for him. Uh, but, you know, I think his offense is uh, very good. I think he has potential to do even better next year with all of that. Uh, I did put say Suzuki at my eight for that reason. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, very, very encouraging stuff in his second year um, over from Japan. What I think it's what a lot of fans are hoping for or what a lot of Red Sox fans are hoping for with Masataki Yoshida is just that general Mm -hmm. improvement from first year to second year in the states um so yeah hopefully that goes down uh my number seven is uh, a very very young man very highly touted prospect when he came up but uh you know also i'm just optimistic about what he can bring to the table in 2024 i like this i like where this is going uh riley green yeah um, who uh who unfortunately was called up like what five days before you were about to interview him uh one day one day (laughs) yeah very unfortunate (laughs) but um regarding his 2023 season where he did have some injury trouble um he still uh he still put up some great numbers uh it was his age 22 season as well which is why i'm also very optimistic about him he was 74th percentile or higher in sweet spot rate hard hit rate barrel rate 
average exit velocity, and all expected categories. And then on the bases, he was seven for seven on stolen bases and had a 49% extra base taken rate. Um, his defensive numbers weren't great, but I think they were better in his rookie year. Uh, so I think he can improve on that as well. So I think there's just a lot to be optimistic about heading into his age 23 season. So that's why I have Riley Green uh, at number seven, despite maybe not having uh, quite the resume um, as some of the as some of the guys I have behind him, but uh, yeah, I, I really like him going into 2023. Who do you have as your number seven? I also have Riley Green. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I think I made that kind of inferred with my reaction there, but I think Riley Green is two things away, maybe three things away from being an elite player. You know, we talked about how there's a large gap between five and six on this list. Riley Green is a couple uh, aspects away from being above that gap when it's the ability to hit lefties consistently uh better contact and a better uh batted ball profile he does have a 48 percent he did have a 48.9 percent ground ball rate last year uh and a 21.8 percent fly ball rate i'd like to see those shifts maybe like a couple percent percentile points each maybe like 45 and 24 percent respectively uh one thing that i love about him is that he does not pop the ball up at all. He has a 1% pop-up rate in his career uh, with 500 batted balls. That is the lowest of the uh, 204 batters over the last two seasons with at least uh, 500 batted balls. Uh, he also has a 91.6% exit velocity and 11.3% barrel rates um, and very good expected numbers in general. He had an expected slugging of about 500 last year, which is about 50 points be- above where his actual slugging was. His expected batting average is pretty on par with what he actually put up. Uh, he's walking at a, around a league average rate, uh, you know, good sweet spot rate, good hard hit rate, good barrel rate, uh, big, extremely uh, effective base running numbers, good sprint speed. Um, you know, he, there are a lot of things that he does very well, and he's only going into his age 23 season. So, you know, I think Riley Green has shown that he has a very high ceiling so far. You know, it's all about putting those few things together, but I have him at number seven, and that might even be, that might even look pretty conservative by the end of the year. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, he, when he, when he was, uh, when he came up, he was a number two prospect in baseball. So, obviously a lot of upside also um i think he was number five overall pick when he was drafted yes um so yeah obviously a lot of a lot of upside with him and uh yeah with his ground ball rate like even with the 49 percent ground ball rate he's still at a very good sweet spot rate which really speaks to um how well how good he is at avoiding pop-ups uh because normally like if you have a 49 percent ground ball rate you're not gonna have a good sweet spot rate um mm-hmm. and, and yeah the sweet spot rate by the way that's important because uh it's mostly line drives and low fly balls and they result in usually around a 600 batting average and 1100 slugging percentage for uh for hitters um so it's good to avoid that if you're a pitcher and it's avoid it's good to get that if you're a hitter and my number six is someone you previously talked about um very good uh batted ball better ball profile i'm talking about seiya suzuki um he basically improved every part of his game in 2023 uh he had a 1.8 mile per hour jump in average exit velocity his uh overall slugging percentage jumped 52 points uh he has very very good chase and walk numbers um and he had similar expected numbers to riley green but in a uh in a bigger sample size so i kind of trust those numbers a little bit more than uh, than I do with green. Although green is younger and has more upside. I still think say Suzuki is uh, the better right fielder, but still very, very close. Um, and yeah, just like it's all right across the board for say Suzuki. The only, I think down the, the only thing he's down on is like arm value uh, for, um, for fielding. And even then it's like not that crazy of a deal, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I think we're both pretty optimistic on uh what Sus on what Suzuki brought to the table last year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, who's your number six? So for my number six, I'm going with a guy that you mentioned earlier and, and I know was one of your players to watch in the past. It is Max Kepler uh, from the twins. Yeah. He improved drastically last year. I don't know if it was the, the shift ban or not, but I don't think it was because his exit velocity went up 
uh, almost three miles an hour between 2022 and 23. I don't think the shift had much to do with that. Um, a 503 expected slugging, which was actually above what he really put up. Uh, 89th percentile there, 89th percentile as well on the average exit velocity. Um, you know, everything, every single one of his batting uh, percentiles is above 50%. So he's, you know, above average everywhere, uh, but elite in a lot of the actual batted ball related metrics. Um yeah, I mean, also his fielding has been exceptional. Uh, it was last year on Baseball Savant. Uh, I, you know, it, it did on Fangraphs, did actually take kind of a step down, but uh, he still had four outs above average uh, on Baseball Savant. He had very good arm value, good arm strength. And yeah, the base running numbers are what they are. Uh, I'm not too worried about it because base running can be like very weird and, and inconsistent with guys. And Kepler's had good base running numbers before. So like, you know, he could just go back to it next year. Like, it's hard to, it's hard. I don't know. I feel, I find it very hard to weigh that when you never really know what a guy's going to do year in and year out. Um, Yeah, he upped his fly ball rate to 31% last year. It was up from 24.5%. And, you know, that's a really good combination of, of, you know, upping your exit velocity by three miles an hour, upping your fly ball rate by like seven, eight degrees or percent rather. Um. Yeah, I think it's a very good combination, and I think if he does that again, Max Kepler is going to be kind of a leader in that Twins offense. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, so really. This is where. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. This is where it. Ha- this is where the. This is where the gap is. Yes, for sure. Um, yeah, with Kepler, really optimistic about his exit velocity and and all other numbers uh, regarding his offense. And yeah, with the base running with the base running numbers, like you do have to look at it over like a multi-year sample typically because like two, two extra times being thrown out on the bases can really like throw your base running yep. numbers off. So yeah. Uh, something, something to look out for when evaluating players, but uh, yeah, now this is, this is where the big gap is. I think this is where yeah. you go from the. Now, I, I think it's, I just want to say, assuming we have the, the same top five, which I hope we do, because I think it'd be very hard to argue against any of these guys. I love that the only discrepancies on our list is the guys we have at 10. Um, yes. Which yes. like Springer Springer was my 11. I'm sure you considered Santander. Yeah. 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 Like, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's the only difference we have. It's the only difference we have in terms of guys we put on the list. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, this is where, this is where the gap is created. Cause this is where we go from the guys who are like, Oh, they had, they made some improvements last year. Like they're pretty good. I think I'm excited for what they are to the top five where it's like, oh, these guys are really, really good. Um, and uh my number five is Adolis Garcia. Um, he had a you know, he had a pretty excellent season last year in which he had 39 home runs, obviously, like very, very encouraging. Uh had a very encouraging drop in chase rate last year, also a very good increase in fly ball rate and barrel rate and he had an 836 ops uh with plus eight fielding run value uh along with that uh his his, he had a great arm value as well like just throwing guys out really impactful arm um and then at the plate uh in terms of just the underlying numbers he was 90th percentile or better in hard hit rate barrel rate average exit velocity expected slugging and expected woba and then on the bases, he has a 59% expect uh he has a 59% extra base taken rate in the last two years, um, which is really, 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 really good. The league average extra base taken rate was 42% last year. He's 17 points above that, uh, which is really good. And then also he's been pretty healthy over the last uh three years. He's played 145 or more games in each of the last three years. So he hasn't been someone to worry about as as taking on and off the uh, injured list. So yeah, Adolis Garcia is my number five. Who do you have at number five? Yeah, I mean, you absolutely nailed it, not just with the ranking, but with the the analysis. Yeah, I think Adolis Garcia is at five is probably the biggest lock on this grid, on this uh on this list. You know, he's he's far and away better than everyone above him. Uh, but you know, the, the top four are really tough to beat. I have him at number five as well, 
there are so many things that I loved about Adolis Garcia this year, and it's mostly these steps forward that he took from his his 2021 rookie breakout, where you know he was hitting the ball well and getting some good results, but there was some clear underlying issues. You know, he had an eighth percentile sweet spot rate, a sixth percentile chase rate, a sixth percentile whiff rate, a fifth percentile strikeout rate, and a sixth percentile walk rate. The thing that sticks out to me the most is that between 2021 and 2023, his walk rate went from 5.1% to 10.3%. It more than doubled. It basically exactly doubled. And not only that, but the batted ball metrics are still there. He's hitting the ball hard. He's hitting it in the air. Like you mentioned, the increase in fly ball rate from 25% to 36%. The decrease in ground ball rate from 41% to 37.8%. Uh, he's pulling the ball a lot more, which, you know, for a guy with his power that's hitting that many fly balls, that's huge. He's pulling the ball 39% of the time, which is something he's always done. But he's also, he's up his sweet spot rate to 36%. He upped it from 29% in 2021 uh yeah i mean he did everything very well last year he plays good defense he has a strong arm he runs the bases very well uh, and he led the rangers to a world series and he also was kind of the the vocal or the on-field vocal leader for that team you know with the astros stuff and you know the walk-off home run like he did it all for them yeah alcs mvp who could forget that performance so now we move on to my number four um we're i don't know it could get a little bit squirrely but you just don't know what he's going to bring to the table offensively considering what he did in both 2021 and then eventually 2023 but talking about fernando tatis jr who is easily the best defender in this group uh he had a 12 or 13 uh fielding run value according to Statcast, and way more defensive runs saved uh as well um which is judged on like the same kind of scale but uh but yeah fernando tatis jr was just turned into the best defensive right fielder in the game seemingly uh he's also one of the best base runners in this group and he's still a very very good hitter which is why you know i, I have him top five despite ha him having a 771 ops last year uh he had very good uh exit velocity and barrel rate numbers in 2023 uh it was just a matter of like where he was putting the ball it was very very odd uh he just needs to pull the ball more uh especially when he's hitting fly balls only 27% of the barrels he hit last year were pulled as opposed to 44% in 2021, which was the difference between him having, you know, 42 home runs in 2021 uh, instead of 25 home runs uh, last year. So I think if he just pulls more barrels, he's going to have uh, better luck in the home run to fly ball ratio uh, category. And that could make him, you know, that could make, get, get him ahead of, you know, guys, the the guys that I have uh, ahead of him. But for now, considering that sort of regression he had offensively, I, I can comfortably com put him behind him, uh, put him behind them. But uh, I mean, just defensively on the bases and offense, he's really the whole package. And th that's why I have him number four. Yeah. Uh, so this is where there is a bit of discrepancy. At my number four, I did put Kyle Tucker uh, from the Astros. Kyle Tucker has been, you know, a very consistent offensive staple for the Astros for a few years now. It's kind of weird because he wasn't there in 2017. He really was only like kind of there in 2019, but he he's like, he feels like a guy that's just always been there uh, for them. But last year in particular, he was pretty much elite on every front of offense. He doesn't strike out. He walks a lot. He doesn't chase. He doesn't whiff. He hits the ball hard. He hits it in the air. He pulls the ball. Uh, he does basically everything you could ever ask a hitter to do. Um, and you know, as a lefty, I think he takes advantage of that short right field wall. Um, you know, unfortunately, he didn't hit exactly 30 home runs this year like he did in, in 2021 and 2022. He only hit 29, but he made up for it by stealing 30 bases for the first time last season. Uh, the reason I put him at number four was because he regressed quite heavily on defense. Uh, last year, he went from 89th percentile OAA, 5 OAA to... Uh, negative six OAA last year, ninth percentile. Uh, and on fan graphs, they agreed he went from 2.6 defensive runs of average to negative 12.3. Um, so you know, it was a, it was a bit of a tough decision to make between him and Tatis, but you know, and I'll get to Tatis later, but I mean, Tucker is you know, I mean, he's he's right there as well. So, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the defensive regression was tough but i mean you know exactly what to expect from him on offense and he did exactly that last year right yeah yeah um <clears throat> yeah the tatis versus tucker debate is interesting because i think also with the um 
with Tatis, he, there's like far, far more upside. Like if you're asking me to bet, mm-hmm. like who's more likely to win an MVP this year, I'd say Tatis. But if you're yeah. asking me who's more likely to get, you know, I don't know, five wins above replacement, I might say Kyle Tucker um, and just have like a generally good positive season. I might just say Tucker, but uh, I have Kyle Tucker, number three. Um, he just adding to the offensive excellence. Uh, he was great. He's just great on all fronts offensively, whether it's strikeout rate, walk rate, um, batted ball numbers. He's just been great. And that's resulted in him having a 139 OPS plus over the last three years. Also over the last three years, he's averaging 30 home runs, 34 doubles and 23 stolen bases per year with a 51% extra base taken rate. And defensively, um, he regressed a lot last year, but I think what I'm banking on is that it's an outline season and not necessarily a trend because over the last three years, he's averaged negative one uh, fielding run value, which is fairly neutral. So I think that's going to sort of even out because as we know, uh, single year uh, defensive ev- evaluations can get a little bit squirrely. So I'm kind of banking on him to just bounce back to like whatever an average fielder or whatever he was. Cause I don't think he's necessarily a, uh, the five outs above average that he was in 2022, but also I don't think he's the negative six outs above average that he was in 2023. And then uh, as far going back to his offense, um, the expected numbers are also good and even better than his actual numbers, which are, which are also really good. He was, um, excuse me, 93rd percentile or better in all expected categories last year. So um, yeah, Kyle Tucker, I mean, one of the best, you know, sort of under the radar, one of the best hitters in baseball um, and just is really, really consistent. And then defensively, um, yeah, not great last year, but I'm curious to see if that's a trend or if that's more just an outline season. I'm kind of banking more on the outline season uh, thought, but um, I guess, yeah, now on to your uh, number three here. Yeah, at number three, this is where I put Fernando Tatis Jr. Uh, you mentioned the upside and, you know, the, the potential, like, more likely to win MVP. Uh, and that is kind of what led me to put him in the three spot here. You know, he's only going into his age 25 season. And I think it kind of speaks volume to his talent that he kind of just walked into the outfield last year for the first time in his major league career and was, like, maybe the best defensive outfielder in baseball. Like, it's it's just an absurd thing. And I don't think anyone was ever accounting for that scenario uh you know when you when you hear oh god this guy is doing a positional change that's not good uh you never really see it where it's like not only do they handle themselves but they're actually elite at it um and you know Tatis's down year was a 49 percent hard hit rate it was a 91.9 percent nine uh, mile per hour exit velocity excuse me um something that really amazed me for a guy that was facing major league pitching for the first time in about a year and a half his strikeout rate went down by almost six percent between 2021 and 23. Um, I think that's a very good sign. You know, I mean, it, you'd think the timing is kind of going to be the struggle and you can, like I mentioned, like you mentioned, it kind of was with his barrels, but uh, you know, I still think that everything will come together for him. You know, he's just way too talented to, uh, to not to fizzle out like that. Um, I think he's going to, you know, I think a lot of people have had this take before, but I think a lot of people have, compared 2023 Fernando Tatis Jr. to 2022 Ronald Acuna Jr., where he, you know, came back from a an injury, uh, you know, and then, you know, sort of struggled, like had, you know, showed the flashes of his potential, but still, you know, kind of struggled uh, from time to time and then came back the next year and won MVP. Um, Tatis did a lot of things a lot better than he had done pre-injury slash suspension in 2023. And I think, you know, there's potential for him to bring it all together in 2024. And uh, that's what I'm kind of rooting for here. Yeah, absolutely. Not rooting for it, but that's what I'm banking on, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With, you know, that's that's kind of the reason why you're putting him above um, some of the other guys. And yeah, like, yeah, with with Todd Tease Jr. Yeah, it, it seemed like last year was more of a, like, he was sort of finding his footing again. Um, like he he regressed a little bit on the hard hit ball and like, uh, and, and, uh, barrel rate rate. fronts, but still like very good. And I just, I see those going back up and yeah, part of his problem was just like he was, and part of why his, uh, expected numbers were a lot higher than his actual numbers was because, uh, he was just hitting those hard hit balls in the wrong places, like hitting, 
you know, really hard fly balls, but not to the parts of the ballpark that, you know, would give him a home run. I'm trying to see where his, uh, where his BABIP was. Um, cause I, I think, um, it was, uh, 299, which yeah. is far below his, uh, his uh career average as a as a faster guy but i think he just he's just gotta he's just gotta pull the ball a little bit more and that could really make a make a difference for him um so yeah now on to number two um this is uh where i'm gonna go with juan soto um he is obviously and he's been a left fielder the last couple years but uh fangrass hasn't projected as a right fielder i think verdugo is going to be playing left for the yankees but uh, yeah, I mean, with Juan Soto, I'm not going to say anything that hasn't been said about him already. Uh, he's obviously consistently at a very high level at the plate. He has a 140 OPS plus or better in every single year of his career, which has been six years so far. Uh, he's played 150 games in each of the last three years. So health has never been a concern with Juan Soto, really. Um, but, you know, as far as why I wouldn't put him number one, uh, bad defense and bad base running it takes him out of that conversation for me. Uh, he has the seventh lowest defensive runs above average in baseball over the last two years. But obviously, you know, he's a top 10 hitter in baseball. Um, a lot of people would put him top five, but still, and some people would say like potentially even best hitter in baseball, considering how consistent he's been, how great those strikeout walk numbers are, how great that quality contact is. He's great offensively, um, but, you know, the guy I have above him, uh, has better, you know, defense and base running and, uh, arguably was a, was a better hitter last year as well. So yeah. Uh, who do you have as your number two? I also have Juan Soto in my two. Um, I won't, I won't get into any of the things that you didn't already mention or that you already mentioned with the, uh, with the defense and base running. I want to talk about, well, first of all, I mean, you know, we know why he's number two. He's, uh, he's the best uh, on base percentage guy in baseball. He hits the ball incredibly hard. He doesn't strike out very often. He's very good at uh, plate discipline. He doesn't chase all that stuff. You know, uh, I really want him to have a better batted ball profile. I'm begging for like a 45% ground ball rate in a season. He's been above 50 in each of the last four seasons outside of 2022, uh, which was ironically his worst season, but uh but I really, really need to see like a 45% uh, ground ball rate, like a 25 to 27% fly ball rate, and then like a 21 to 22% line drive rate. Like I really want to see it. I don't want to see another line drive rate below 20%. I don't want to see another ground ball rate around 50%. I feel like the Juan Soto's maximum potential is lifting the ball a lot more. Um, I hope that Yankee Stadium kind of incentivizes him to do that a little more because he's going to have that short porch out there. He's a guy that if he lifts the ball more with that stadium, he could hit 50 home runs easily. He could easily hit 50 home runs. Uh, and then you could probably throw up like a four, 430 plus on base percentage in a year. Uh, there's so much potential there. I just, I so desperately want to see it come out in full. Yeah, 100%. And, and yeah, like we, we talk all day about his ability to walk and stuff, but it's, it's still really, really good power hitter. He hit. 35 home runs last year. And obviously, yeah, as you mentioned, like that, he has so much potential to, to do more. Um, and yeah, like, uh, I was, I was going to, um, actually compare his batted ball profile to 2021, but he also had a, a high ground ball rate there, which he is did because he had a 170 OPS plus. Yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah, like I not... said, still, still feel like we haven't seen the most potential out of him. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, uh, I wonder what, what that's all about. Um, so yeah, obviously Juan Soto, both are number two. And what I imagine will happen is both of our number ones are Ronald Acuna, Ronald Acuna. <laughs> wait, what did you say? Yeah. My, my number one is George Springer. I lied. I didn't put him <laughs> at 11. No, it's yeah. yes. Both of our number ones are Ronald Acuna Jr. That's pretty, yeah, pretty clear. I think. Yeah. He, uh, obviously MVP last year, historic season last year, and uh, it was a well-earned historic season. He was 100th percentile in all of the expected categories and average eggs of velocity. Uh, what was really, really awesome from him was he cut his strikeout rate by more than half. Uh, he had a, he had an 11% strikeout rate, which is ridiculous yeah. considering how, how hard he hits the ball and how talented he is in all of their aspects. 
Um, on the bases, he is averaging 51 stolen bases and a 62% extra base taken rate in the last two years. Uh, so, and and uh, defensively, he has been negative the past few years, but not enough to where it's like a problem. I think he's been negative three and negative four run values um, over the past two seasons, which is nothing too absurd to be that concerned about. Um, decline. Um, but yeah, uh, <laughs> what is, uh, who do you have for, uh, what do you have for Ronald Acuna Jr.? I mean, yeah, I, there's not, it's, it feels like a broken record, you know, I mean, it, what more is there to say? It kind of goes without saying almost, um, he put it all together this year. I mean, he, he his, he averaged a hard hit ball for his exit velocity, 94.7% or 94% of miles an hour. Yeah. You mentioned cutting the strikeout rate, also keeping his walk rate close to 11%. He almost walked more than he struck out. Um, yeah. I mean, he's, he's very dynamic. Yeah. The defense was a little rough for him this year, but that's, that's all right because he made up for it more than made up for it in offense and base running, keeping a, you know, keeping a 10, 12 OPS while simultaneously stealing 73 bases is an absurd, an absurd thing. You know, it's not something, obviously it's not something we've ever seen. Uh, it might not be something we ever see again. Um, you know, he he's so dominant at hitting virtually every pitch. He had over two uh, run value per 100 in four seamers, sinkers, sliders, and curveballs and cutters uh, with minimum uh, about 40 batted balls on each of those, which means for every 100 of so pitches he saw, he produced at least two runs, which is a lot. There's just nothing that you can really get by him. The, the pitch that he had a highest strikeout rate on, uh, with like a subsequent amount of with like a decent amount of plate appearances was a slider at 14 percent like there's nothing that you can really do to beat him um and yeah I mean he's my number one for sure yeah and then obviously yeah obviously with the on the surface stuff uh only 30 60 season in baseball history last year only um only 40 uh 70 season in baseball history and he also had the only only season in the live ball era with a 1000 plus OPS and 70 plus stolen bases. Um, the only other guys to do it in baseball history are Ty Cobb, Joe Kelly from the 1896 uh, Baltimore nice. Orioles, nice. Uh, Pete, Pete Browning from the 1887 Louisville Colonels and Billy Hamilton from the 1894 Philadelphia Phillies. Um, Big that's... list when you got Joe Kelly and Billy Hamilton on there. And I'm not talking about, <laughs> I'm not talking about like 2016. Yeah, nor nor the uh, reliever for the Dodgers, uh, Joe Kelly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, um, do we want to just review our uh, our one through ten here? I, I'll start yes. since I started the list. Uh, number one, I got Ronald Acuna Jr. Or or I guess I'll go in reverse order. Number we'll ten, number George 10, Springer. Yeah. Number nine, Max Kepler. Number eight. Uh, number eight was um, Josh Lowe. Or no. Josh Lowe. Yeah. Number seven, I had Riley Green. Number six, Seiya Suzuki. Five, Adolis Garcia. Number four was Fernando Tatis Jr. Number three was uh, Kyle Tucker. Number two was Juan Soto. And number one was Ronald Acuna Jr. Uh, your yeah, number this was, 10 I think this one. is our best. This is our best list so far in terms of agreement. So I had Anthony Santander at number ten, Josh Lowe at nine, Seiya Suzuki at eight, Riley Green at seven, and Max Kepler at six. Adolis Garcia at five, Kyle Tucker at four, Fernando Tatis Jr. at three, Juan Soto number two, and Ronald Acuna Jr. at number one. Yes, it is a lot more ARR of us to uh to agree on on stuff. Yeah. We <laughs> next week we got uh the corners of the infield. We got first base and third base as our next rankings. Yeah, should be exciting. Third, third base, base third all... base will be a lot of fun. Third base is always a very interesting conversation. Um considering the legacy at that position right now with you know they there's always been the machados arenados uh of the worlds even alex bregman for the past probably half decade but uh yeah you got some new blood over there with uh, i think gunner henderson is, is gunner henderson a projected third baseman or is he a short yes star? i believe so okay so yeah that adds to the adds to the conversation unless unless they put jackson holiday there yeah and how could i forget about the legacy speaking legacy of the third base position i'll slap myself in the face for not mentioning jose ramirez who's the best third baseman arguably mm -hmm. um he, yeah he's uh 
that he is the legacy of the third base. I was just say I'm ready to get I'm ready to I'm ready to get threatened to get kicked off the show for not putting him. Okay, they have Jackson Holiday at short, Gunnar Henderson at third. So yeah. Yeah. Obviously, obviously shout out to Jose Ramirez, um, who is probably gonna be my number one or two at the position. Um yeah. so uh yeah, uh that'll be next week. Excited for that. But uh the last thing we have to get, get into is the Hall of Fame bubble case with uh last week we did Car- Carlos Beltran. This week we are doing Jimmy Rollins. Um, you know, another another World Series champion, uh, but another guy who is early in the ballot. He's in he's on a third year of the ballot. Um, and yeah, I guess we could just get right going here and just talk about where he's at um on the ballot. So we got 9.4% in 2022. Uh, 12.9% in 2023. And uh, this might be a little bit off, but probably pretty much in line, but he has 13.8% in uh, so far in 2024 with about 14.9. Yeah. Yeah. 13.9. So I think another person added it. We, uh, yeah, he's already, he's already uh, confirmed safe uh, to appear on next year's ballot. Yeah, and at the time of I, me putting the notes, he netted plus four, and that might have increased now. Like he mm-hmm. might have, uh, he might have netted more, but uh, no piece. Uh, he's at plus three. Oh wow! Yeah, netted. Uh, he had well, he had one drop in four ads. Yeah, it makes sense with all the people that are um coming on to the ballot right now, but uh, but yeah, so so far he's been very you know, gotten a low amount of support, but albeit enough to stay on the ballot. Um, yeah, do we want to get into the on the surface stats, maybe like two dot points at a time? Yeah. Um, so yeah, with uh with Jimmy Rollins, his career B war puts him at 47.6, and F war he is at 49.6, and he has a 32.6 peak B war, which is 10.6 below the average Hall of Fame shortstop. He also has uh in terms of you know the raw numbers, two thousand four hundred and fifty five hits, two hundred thirty one home runs out of the shortstop position, nine hundred thirty six RBI, uh, fourteen uh, twenty one runs scored, five hundred eleven doubles, four hundred seventy stolen bases, and one hundred fifteen triples. So you know he was a very dynamic hitter. There was a lot of things that he did uh, very well in terms of pure volume. In terms of rate stats, he uh, was a 264 career hitter. He slashed 264, 324, 418 for a 743 career OPS, a 95 OPS plus, and weighted runs created plus, and a grand total of 10,240 plate appearances. Yeah, a lot of longevity and also a lot of speed, as the stolen bases and triples uh, suggest. Um, and then on the defense side of the ball, uh, he was very, very good. 15.9 career defensive wins above replacement, 139 and a half career defensive runs above average, and 51 defensive runs saved at shortstop. Uh, that stat came in, I think, like two years into his career, so didn't miss out too much there. Um, and then in terms of accolades, he uh, was a three-time All-Star, a four-time Gold Glover, and he was the he was a one-time silver slugger in 2007 won the mvp in 2007 as well and was the was a world series champion in 2008 and i'll finish off the uh the on the surface stuff right here where uh you know speaking of the postseason uh his his postseason resume doesn't necessarily support his hall of fame case uh doesn't detract too much from it either but in 215 plate appearances in the postseason he had 246 with a 673 OPS. Um, so that does it for the on the surface portion of the breakdown. And now we will get into the comparisons where we kind of compare where he, you know, compare players sim- that had similar careers t- to him in terms of, um, you know, how many played, how many career played appearances they had, which kind of signify the longevity and how much wins above replacement they had. So with Rollins, we're yeah. looking at players with, 45 to 50 B war in 9,000 to 11,000 plate appearances. Yeah. So in terms of, again, Rollins with 47.6% uh, 
47.6 B war, 49.6% F war. Uh, players with 45 to 50 B war in 9,000 9, to 11,000 plate appearances include Dale Murphy, a guy who maxed out on BBWAA ballots and has also appeared on several era committee ballots and has gotten some support, but not enough to go in. Uh, Jim Rice, who is a 15th year Hall of Famer. Uh, Miguel Tejada, a for another former MVP shortstop, who was a first ballot drop. Uh, Bernie Williams, a second ballot drop. Mark Grace, a first ballot drop. Uh, Joe Judge, not the uh, not the former New York Giants head coach, but a pre-integration non-Hall of Famer. Uh, Tommy Leach, who is a dead ball era non-Hall of Famer. Jimmy Sheckard, who is a dead ball era non-Hall of Famer. Brett Butler, who is a first ballot drop. Lave Cross. This is some incredible names, by the way. Uh, another dead ball era non Hall of Famer, and Nelly Fox, who is a Hall of Famer. So in terms of Hall of Famers, it's Jim Rice and it's Nelly Fox, and then Jimmy Rollins right there with him. Yes. Uh. So there's eleven, or there's yeah, eleven other players in that spectrum of forty five to fifty B WAR and nine thousand to eleven thousand plate appearances. Uh, two of them are Hall of Famers. Two out of eleven. Two out of eleven. Um, and then. Uh, in terms of looking at sort of the rate stats in those plate appearances, uh, players with an OPS plus of between 92 and 98, obviously Rollins had a 95. So players with an OPS plus between 92 and 98 and defensive war between 13 and 17 uh, in 9,000 to 11,000 plate appearances. There's two other uh, players that had those numbers, the specific numbers who are, very similar careers to Jimmy Rollins in terms of offensive and defense production. Uh, those two players are Gary Gay Gary Gaetti, um, who was a first ballot drop, unfortunately. And then red Shane Dice. So nice. Is it Shane Dice? That's that's what I looked up the pre pronunciation when okay. I uh, when I saw him. I think it's Shane Dice. And okay. uh, I'm gonna he... I'm gonna create a burner Twitter account called Not Shane Dice. <laughs> yes, I love that. Go along with the theme here. But uh, yeah, the two players are Gary Gaetti, uh, who was a first ballot drop, and then Red Shane Dice, who is a Hall of Famer, but he did not get in through the BBWAA. He got in through Veterans Era Committee. Um, so now on to the case for Jimmy Rollins being in the Hall of Fame. We do a case for and a case against for every single player that we do on the bubble case breakdowns. Uh, and we'll start out with the case for Jimmy Rollins. Uh, you want to start? I will. So I'll, we'll go to bubbles, to uh, bubbles at a time. Um, he was an everyday shortstop for, you know, one of the best teams, the premier clubs throughout the late 2000s and early 2010s. You know, he was kind of the heartbeat of that Phillies team that won a World Series, got back to the World Series, uh, you know, went to the playoffs and I believe five straight seasons from 2007 through 2011. Correct. Right. Yeah. He was, you know, you know, one of the uh, the mainstays on that team and kind of one of the more beloved figures in Philadelphia. Um, he is one of 16 players to get 2,400 plus hits and 450 plus stolen bases in the modern era. Goes back to 1900. And of the other 15, 13 of them are Hall of Famers. And the other two are Barry Bonds, of course, a Hall of Fame talent who would have gotten in if not for his PED use. And Kenny Lofton, uh, one of the most egregious uh, first ballot drops, a guy who unfortunately appeared on a stacked ballot uh, with guys like Barry Bonds, uh, also in their first year with Kurt Schilling, Sammy Sosa, Roger Clemens, uh, among others. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, like that. That was. That was definitely a weird one. Um, and then uh, along with that, he uh, Jimmy Rollins is one of seven players in baseball history with 500 plus doubles and 450 plus stolen bases. Uh, the other six are Barry Bonds, Ricky Henderson, Paul Molitor, Roberto Alomar, Ty Cobb, Ed Delahanty, and Hannes Wagner. Or maybe he's one of eight players. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, Bonds, Henderson, Molitor, Alomar, Cobb, Delahanty, and Hannes Wagner all of those guys are Hall of Famers except for Barry Bonds. Uh, and then along with that, Jimmy Rollins was very consistent at getting hits, stolen bases, and a decent amount of home runs. Uh, he has 10 seasons with 150 plus hits, 30 plus stolen bases, and 10 plus home runs. No other player in baseball history has more than six such seasons. Yeah, and uh, continuing on with uh, with more stats, he has eight seasons 
with 35 plus doubles and 20 plus stolen bases, which is tied for the third most in baseball history, uh, trailing only ballot mate Bobby Abreu and also Hall of Famer Hannes Wagner. He is tied with Hall of Famers Nap Lajoie and Ed Delahanty. And three of those previous four names were uh, dead ball era. So, I mean, he's, you know, he was very unique for his time. And then additionally, uh, oh, wait, no. Yeah, okay. And then he also has five plus season, five seasons with 35 plus stolen bases and fewer than 10 caught stealings. One of the most efficient base stealers of all time. Uh, the people he is tied with for most of all time include uh, Ichiro, who is a future Hall of Famer, Tim Raines, who is a Hall of Famer, and Ozzie Smith, who is a Hall of Famer. Yes, indeed. And uh, along with that, there are 23 other players in baseball history, along with Rollins, with 500 plus doubles and 100 plus triples. 21 are Hall of Famers. The other two are Pete Rose, who is definitely Hall, Hall of Fame talent. And then Johnny Damon, who, you know, isn't a Hall of Famer, okay. but definitely on the fringe of uh, of that conversation. And then uh, to cap off the case for Jimmy Rollins, he has six seasons with 720 plus plate appearances, 10 plus home runs and 30 plus stolen bases. No other player in baseball history has more than three such seasons. So it's part of the longevity with him is he played like every day. Didn't miss games. Ten, he's elite, ten, he's elite. Uh, t- yeah, ten seasons with over 150 games played. Yes, and a leadoff hitter and a very good offense, so he was able to get a lot of plate appearances. Has the uh, single season record for plate appearances in a season. Uh, shout out Jimmy Rollins. Yeah, but, 778. Uh, yeah, 778. But um, now we get into the case against Jimmy Rollins. Um. So yeah, let's let's start out with the case against yeah. Jimmy Rollins. So in the case against Jimmy Rollins, he is far below the average wins above replacement and peak wins above replacement on according to baseball reference for Hall of Fame shortstops. Uh 20.1 career B war uh, below average, 10.6 career peak war below average. So uh he's not quite there in terms of uh stacking up with the other Hall of Fame shortstops in terms of career war. Um, and additionally, he never finished top five in his league among position player B war. He only finished top 10 in two seasons among the uh, 17 that he played. Right. And then in, translating that to F war, it's the same story. Pretty much. I uh, never finished top five in his league among position players in fan graphs, wins above replacement and only finished top 10 once. And this is also including, um, this is just national league, not even MLB. Um, and then, uh, as far as OPS and OPS plus goes, which we believe are probably the most, you know, the most valuable offensive statistic individually and maybe even team wise, but uh, he never finished top 10 in OPS or OPS plus uh, in his, in his career. Yeah. And defensively speaking, he only finished top five in a range factor per game at shortstop twice. So, you know, in terms of his position, which is one of the premier defensive positions in baseball, uh, in terms of range factor, he only finished top five twice out of 17 seasons. And uh, he only had two five win seasons on baseball reference. And there are 158 retired players t- uh, with exactly two five win seasons. And only 11 of them are Hall of Famers. None of them uh, that are Hall of Famers played after 1973. So by his standards, uh, you know, people that only accumulated that many five win seasons don't usually tend to become Hall of Famers. Yeah, and then you carry that over to um, how he compares in terms of uh, OPS plus. Uh, he had a career OPS plus below 100, which you know obviously that means you're a below average hitter for your career. So you you need some stuff to make up for it. So there are only four players to uh, start their career during the integration era that have been inducted into the Hall of Fame with a career OPS plus below 100, and all four of those. Uh, players that were elected into the hall of fame had at least six more defensive war than jimmy rollins so in order to be a below average hitter and be in the hall of fame you have to have a really really elite defense and while rollins was a good defender he wasn't at that you know ozzy smith Luis apriccio level um that they were at to um to get elected into the hall of fame and then uh to sort of retract uh one of the stats that we had in the case for Jimmy Rollins on the list of players with 500 plus doubles and 450 plus stolen bases previously mentioned. He had the lowest career uh, OPS plus by 21 points and the lowest career war 
by 19.4. So, you know, he didn't really fit into that mold of uh, that list of 500 doubles and 450 plus stolen bases. I think the the ne- next worst player might have been uh, Roberto Alomar, who had like a 116 OPS plus so. and yeah. uh, 67 WAR, um, and he was on a on a different level than Jimmy Rollins in our opinion. Yeah, and I think a lot of the reason why Jimmy Rollins is still on the ballot and why we're still talking about his Hall of Fame case was his MVP in 2007. Uh, unfortunately, it really does not hold up sabermetrically. Uh, in the National League, he ranked 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7th in baseball reference wins above replacements. Uh, he ranks outside the top 10 in OPS. Uh, he was at best fifth most deserving of that award that year. Um, Albert Pujols had over two and a half more wins above replacement. He actually had a higher D war despite being at first base. He had the highest D war season for a first baseman ever uh, that season, which was pretty wild. David Wright also uh, probably a more deserving candidate. Um, and I'm not saying, you know, we need to take back that award, but, you know, Saber match, you know, in, in the days since 2007, where we look at a lot, at a lot more numbers to determine MVP, if we had to rewrite history, I think the writers would have given it to Albert Pujols and not the, to Jimmy Rollins. Uh, and effectively, the lack of that MVP might take away a lot of the Hall of Fame support. Uh, and the last thing in the case against Jimmy Rollins is that his number of hits, 2,400, carry a lot of weight in his Hall of Fame case. But he was only a 264 hitter without a high walk rate or without high power numbers. You know, I don't think being a 264 hitter alone says you're not a hall of famer i'm sure we've advocated for guys with similar batting averages uh, and i'm sure we've advocated for guys with less than 2400 hits but uh you know he lacked the walk rate he lacked the power and i understand that it's the shortstop position where you're not meant to have those things but uh you know jimmy rollins didn't have them and he also in 264 is not that crazy for someone who didn't possess those things yeah exactly and yeah he's he was a very good player but just kind of uh he kind of falls off um, in far as far as the Hall of Fame scale. Also, shout out to uh, Chipper Jones, who had a 1029 OPS in yeah. 2007, um, finished sixth in MVP, though. Led, led the league in OPS, had a 425 on base percentage, but yeah, did not did not get the proper love. Um, he didn't. I probably have to go after this recording, by the way, but uh, I think if we could wrap this up in three minutes. Uh, neither of us have voted for Jimmy Rollins in the past. Uh, I'll just say that I don't plan on voting for him this year, but I think it is it is good that he is gaining votes this year in particular because there are a lot of guys that have not gotten uh, the rise in support that Jimmy Rollins has seen. I'm talking about Francisco Rodriguez, who is at minus two in net gained. Uh, Alex Rodriguez is at minus one. Manny Ramirez is at minus one. Andy Pettit is at minus three. Mark Burley is at minus five. Bobby Abreu is at minus three. And then Todd Heldon, Andrew Jones, and Omar Vizcal are all at a net zero. So the fact that Jimmy Rollins is plus three is definitely very good uh, in this year in particular, because this could have easily been a regression year for him, but it seems like it's not going to be. Yeah. And and we've talked about, you know, the impact that having Beltre, Utley, and Maurer arrive on this, on this ballot could have on a, on fringe guys like Jimmy Rollins, but fortunately for him, he's kept that support and improved his support, or I guess had his support rise. He he didn't do anything. He didn't go out and campaign to get his support. He's, you know, he, uh, just more people happen to be voting for him, but, um, anything more before we, uh, wrap this up? Cause this, uh, zoom thing is about to run out. Yeah, no, I think that's it. Um, next week we're doing Chase Utley as our final uh, bubble case breakdown for this year before the election. Uh, I'm very excited. I'm very very excited for this year. Yes, very good stuff. Very good stuff. Um, yeah, it's uh less than two weeks away, so very happy mm-hmm. about that. Um, so yeah, if you hopefully you know you enjoyed the episode here, uh, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify and want to watch the conversation as it happens, go to the YouTube channel. It is called Above Replacement Radio. We're going to have a playlist with all of our uh, individual positional rankings, left fielders, center fielders, starting pitchers, and right fielders so far. And uh, we are continuing our YouTube playlist of the uh, Hall of Fame bubble case breakdown. So go and make sure to check out the YouTube channel and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Also, check us out on social media. Follow me on Twitter at Chris underscore Gianta. Follow Daniel on both Twitter and Instagram at Daniel underscore Curran and follow the show Instagram out of our replacement radio for all the show needs. We hope you enjoy this one and we hope to see you next week where we will be ranking the third base and first base positions and talking about Chase Utley's bubble case 
their Hall of Fame bubble case. We will see you then. This conversation. This conversation is over. Is over.